Good afternoon and welcome to the fifth annual Genocide Studies Conference at the Naval War College. Our theme for this year is the psychology of genocide. I am Dr. Hayat Alvi. I'm an associate professor at the college and I am the organizer of this conference. It is our great fortune to have with us today some of the most esteemed scholars in interdisciplinary fields to discuss the psychology of genocide. Their bios are available uh, in, as well as the conference program in the chat box of this uh, session. I encourage you to please read their bios and the itinerary for today is also included in the program. So if you go to the chat box in Zoom right now, you will find the link to all the bios of the panelists and the itinerary for this conference. Before we begin, I need to go over a few administrative items. So to begin with is our kind of standard disclaimer, which is uh, to note that everything presented today represents the speaker's own personal views. We have two panels today and a Q&A session will follow each panel. You will be able to type your questions in the Q&A menu on the panel below. You will take, uh, sorry, we will take a short break in between the two panels. This conference is being recorded. However, our keynote speaker, General Romeo Dallaire, prefers not to be recorded. Therefore, we will stop recording during his keynote address and resume recording after he is finished. There will be no Q&A with General Dallaire. It has been a personal ambition of mine to invite General Dallaire to the Genocide Studies Conference. I consider it a great honor that he has accepted the invitation and he will deliver the keynote address today. This conference could not happen without the generous support of the Naval War College Foundation. Also, I wish to acknowledge and thank the Naval War College Events Department, especially Sharla Fiore, who has worked tirelessly for this conference. Also the Graphics Department, Public Affairs Office, and the IT and Audiovisual Departments have worked very hard to make this happen. Thank you all very much. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce the provost of the Naval War College, Dr. Stephen Mariano, who will say a few words and introduce our honored guest speaker, General Dallaire. Provost Mariano, over to you. Thank you very much. I, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, you mentioned what an honor it is to have General Dallaire. Well, it's an honor for me as well to uh, be uh, opening this conference, uh, which is the fifth uh, annual genocide conference. And my compliments to you, Hyatt, for being the driving force behind this and to over 60 participants I now see online at this a great, great event. Um, on behalf of Admiral Chatfield, uh, the president of the Naval War College, I'd like to welcome everyone today. Unfortunately, she can't be here. She's off uh, uh, doing some travel. Uh, and she wanted me to personally tell you, Hyatt, that she regrets not being able to, to participate, uh, but is a full a supporter of this, uh, of this annual event. Um, the theme of this year's uh, conference is the psychology of genocide, and both from the perpetrator and the victim's uh, perspectives. Um, we have an outstanding lineup of scholars that you're going to soon meet, uh, who will be discussing and analyzing the psychology of genocide. And genocide is still with us today, uh, whether it's uh, happening as we speak in Ukraine, if you've been following the news about some, some mass graves being uncovered or in Myanmar or other places, there's clearly uh, a, a relevance to this topic in our ongoing activities in the world today. It's also important for the US military to address the subject of genocide and it takes the military intervention to stop genocide. In fact, as I was looking through, I just moved here. I've been the provost for a couple of months and I've got all my boxes of books and I've been unpacking my books. And I find things like a mass atrocity response operation handbook and a 
guiding principles for stabilization and reconstruction. And of course, uh, what I'm sure will be talked about a little bit, seminal work on the responsibility to protect that in some ways was brought to us by the events in Rwanda and of course our speaker uh, today and a very uh, historic moment that is uh, still uh, affecting us all. So th this conference is uh, important and is aligned with the objectives of the Naval War College. And I just wanna add one more set of anecdotes here. Uh, up here in Newport, we routinely host uh, congressional delegations from the United States Congress that come to look at our curriculum and our programs. And they always ask us why we're teaching certain topics. And just in the last two visits, I've had to answer questions about our curriculum in the context of similar subjects as this one and say, this is important to us. It's important to our programs. It's important that we continue to be part of the dialogue and the debate, the research uh, on uh, this topic and other topics related. So there is interest in this topic, not just here at the Naval War College, but in the government of the United States. And it's up to all of us to continue that work and advance knowledge uh, in these areas. And again, thank you to Provost Mariano for an outstanding introduction um, and his reflections as well. And I know he has a busy schedule, so he might have to run off as well. So thank you. Uh, we will resume now with panel one. I will not read anyone's bios. You have the bios available in the program link that's uh, provided in the chat. So please do read the bios. Uh, we will begin with panel one with Dr. Leanne Perry, and then we'll go to Dr. Raquel Perez, and then uh, Dr. Don Thimi. So uh, Dr. Perry, whenever you're ready. Um, okay, so hello everyone. I'm Dr. Leanne Perry. I am with the College of Leadership and Ethics here at the Naval War College. Um, prior to joining the War College a year ago, um, my career was focused mainly on um, the research uh, of violent criminals. I worked with the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit, um, Naval Criminal Investigative Service, better known as NCIS, um, and also with Facebook's Global Security Intel team looking at um, dangerous organizations like uh, violent extremist groups, jihadists, cartels, etc. Um, so today I'm going to talk with you all about some of the social psychological concepts related to perpetrators of genocide and, and mass violence more broadly. Um, and for the purpose of today's talk, when I refer to perpetrators, um, what I mean is the rank and file actors. So not the orchestrators or the instigators of the mass violence, but, but the, the groups that, that are following um, in, their, in their footsteps. Okay, so the main question we'll think through together um, for this next 20 minutes or so is this. How do ordinary people come to commit these extraordinary acts of violence? So as human beings, we often think that there's these um, extraordinary acts that must have caused, or that must have this extraordinary cause, right? Um, and this might be true on some occasions, but sometimes um, the causes can actually be quite ordinary. And so while you know there are also individual level factors that are at play in these extraordinary acts of violence, for this particular discussion, what we'll focus on is um, using group dynamics um, and social psychological factors to better understand these individuals' behaviors. Okay, so one key piece in understanding this behavior is a psychological construction of the other, okay? And what this refers to is thinking about people in terms of an us and a them, an in-group and an out-group. So we're primed to think about the world in an, un, in an us them way from the time we're pretty young. Think about things like um, cliques at school, um, being in sports when you're in middle school or high school, um, things like that. So it's kind of priming us to start thinking in that way of having this in-group and this out-group. And what we see in the case of mass violence is that the other, right, somebody in the out-group is seen to pose such a threat to the in-group that they need to be eliminated. The other poses this threat, whether it's real or perceived. And so because we're already wired with this us versus them thinking, regimes and people in power can play off of this to exacerbate it for destructive purposes. And they begin to define who we are 
by who we are not, right? So the in-group, out-group thinking can have some evolutionary benefit to it, right? Let's think about um, with infants. So they tend to favor people who have a voice they recognize or who look like them, but it can be taken to a point of being destructive, even though it has this evolutionary benefit piece to it, right? There is a point where it becomes destructive. And when we get to this level of threat perception by the in-group members, all sense of individuality gets overtaken by this collective or social group, by this in-group. And the person's identity ends up getting redefined as the group identity. Now, we all have multiple identities based on multiple things. Uh, some of those being religion, race, gender, what sports team we root for, what career field we're in. But in situations of this type of violence, genocidal violence and mass violence, a group in power begins to say, it's this one identity that matters, this one in-group identity that, that is the end all be all. So having this us versus them mentality, um, it's necessary for these mass acts of violence, but it's not sufficient. Other elements do need to be in place for this to move toward violence against the outgroup. So social psychologists, Billowitz and Volhart, discuss how two main dimensions of stereotypes, and these two dimensions being warmth and competence, determine typical reactions to a given group. And they identify two specific forms of prejudice related to genocide that come from this. They identify envious prejudice, which is against groups that are perceived as high in competence, but low in warmth. And you can think of an example here as, as wealthy individuals. And a dehumanizing prejudice, which would be against groups that are perceived as low in both competence and warmth. And, and an example here would be um, homeless individuals. And so you'll note that both of these stereotypes involve the low warmth piece, okay? So these two forms of stereotypes, they appear in almost all genocides, but in, in different stages, okay? So the envious prejudice tends to show up more on the front end in the earlier stages, whereas the dehumanizing prejudice comes in as, as the, these levels of violence escalate. And they're also disseminated often through things like propaganda or other forms of, of hate speech. And so I'm gonna go into each of those two different types of prejudice now. So we'll start off with the envious prejudice. And this is the type of prejudice that's characterized, as I said, by the high competence, but low warmth. And so there's a social science professor named Peter Glick, and he has suggested that envious prejudice is the basic ideology underlying scapegoating. And scapegoating, it occurs when the out, when out groups um, that are seen as powerful and influential are blamed by others for problems that are occurring in society. And under conditions of stress, this can be political stress, economic stress, any other type of societal uncertainty. These are things that General Dallaire was speaking about when he was talking. Basically anything that threatens people's psychological security um, instills some type of fear as General Dallaire was talking about. Um, these ideologies gain popularity that depict the outgroup as strong and capable and also as holding negative intentions toward the in-group, that's very important. This negative intentions piece would be that low warmth dimension of the stereotype. And this way of thinking enables people to be able to put that blame and that responsibility for their own group stressors, their own fears, their own uncertainties at the time onto an out group, right? And the instigators of genocide are able to use this type of prejudice to then bolster their own power and organize the in-group against that stereotyped out-group. So as you see, we keep coming back to that original in-group, out-group, us versus them thinking. So let's kind of pivot here. We'll go over to the dehumanizing prejudice now. And we tend to see this type, as I said, in later stages of genocide. And this focuses on perceptions of the victim group as having both low competence and low warmth. And this depiction is meant to elicit our disgust, our contempt for the other. And that is then further amplified by dehumanizing images of animals that are associated with filth, associated with transmission of infectious diseases. This was another thing that General Dallaire was, was pointing to in, in his discussion. And this disgust motivates an, a further rejection of the other, of the outgroup. And what it also does is it reduces the potential for people to want to help and empathize with that other group. 
So we see this with the Nazis and how they depicted the Jews. As the genocide advanced, Jews were no longer depicted as these strong, cunning villains. Instead, the Nazis disseminated dehumanizing images of Jews, things like rats, cockroaches, snakes, vermin, etc. So dehumanization makes that act of violence less aversive to the person doing it. It makes them feel like it's less morally reprehensible. It's one of the mechanisms of what's called moral disengagement through which human beings manage to maintain this positive image of themselves and of their group, despite the fact that all of these horrendous things are being done and they're committing these harmful actions against other people. And we'll talk more about moral disengagement a, a couple slides from now too. So there's also been um, some neuroscience research um, around dehumanization. Um, and it, it helps to point to some of the underlying mechanisms of this particular stereotype. So some of the areas of the brain, the medial prefrontal cortex, the amygdala and the insula, no need to remember those three, um, have been shown to be related to this dehumanization process and to perceptions related to that. So researchers, Lasana Harris and Susan Fisk, they had participants view pictures of different social groups and they monitored the activation in these different regions of their brains. And what they found was that when participants viewed pictures of members of social groups that were stereotyped as low in worth and competence, remember what we've been discussing as this dehumanization prejudice group, their medial prefrontal cortex was less activated than when they viewed pictures of members of other types of stereotyped groups. So for example, the envious prejudice group that what we talked about earlier. Um, and then this is important because that region of the brain is related to our ability to understand mental states of others and to how we perceive other people. So the region of the brain that helps us better understand these mental states of other people and aids us in how we perceive others was less activated when viewing pictures of groups we tend to see as cold and incompetent. On the other hand, the researchers found that viewing pictures of these dehumanized groups who were perceived as cold and incompetent actually activated a different region of their brain, the amygdala and the insula. And these regions of the brain are responsible for processing information about disgust and regulating avoidant behavior. It goes back to what we were just talking about with, um, with the dehumanizing way of talking about people as being you know, vermin, cockroaches, right? Things that elicit this disgust. So these findings are interesting to consider um, in terms of what's happening within our brains that we're likely not even aware of when we're exposed to out groups who, make, who um, elicit these feelings inside us. Okay, so I noted a couple of slides back that dehumanization is one of the mechanisms of moral disengagement by which people are able to manage um, to preserve this positive image of both themselves and their group despite the fact that they're doing harm to others and they're committing these, these atrocious acts. And so I wanna bring our attention now to some other types of moral disengagement as described by a famous social psychologist named Albert Bandura, as well as a concept that um, social psychologist James Waller discusses in his research on genocidal behavior, um, which is moral reorientation. So starting off with the moral reorientation piece, Dr. Waller notes um, that for most individuals, they don't just turn off their morality when they're doing these, these bad acts, right? These violent acts. They still see themselves as fundamentally moral people. Instead, they reorient their morality. They find a way to present their acts as moral. And for example, um, they convince themselves that, uh, you know, these people in this other group aren't worthy of my moral commitment, right? So they reorient um, their morality. And this also links to victim blaming. You know, people who have committed these terrible acts, they build cognitive structures to keep themselves from facing what they've really done. And one of those structures uh, is blaming the victims. And so Dr. Waller, he gives this interesting example. He says, quote, I think back to the testimony of a Holocaust perpetrator who was asked on his trial by the prosecutor, how did you come to think it was right to kill Jews? And his response was incredible. He said, it's not that I thought it was right to kill them. I thought it was wrong if I didn't kill them. That's a completely different level of moral reorientation in saying it's not just okay to kill, 
if I don't kill them, I'm doing something wrong, unquote. So group leaders can use this, this moral reorientation piece as a way to convince others within their in-group that it's okay to commit these acts of atrocity against other human beings. So we talked about that dehumanization piece, but apart from, from that, which we've discussed, um, Albert Bandura, social psychologist, he describes several other mechanisms of moral disengagement that also can be applied to genocide. And you can see those here on the slide. Moral justification of atrocities, um, for example, that occurred among the Hutu perpetrators who were convinced that they had to kill Tutsis so that the Hutus themselves would not be extinguished, right? So that's how they justify it to themselves morally. Sanitizing language includes, for example, um, use of phrases like final solution instead of mass murder of Jews in gas chambers during the Holocaust. Displacement of responsibility. We see that, we see that um, for example, it occurred when Nazi perpetrators claimed that they had merely carried out orders Right? They put the responsibility and the blame on someone else. They just carried out the orders. It wasn't their responsibility. And then distortion of harmful consequences of the in-group's actions. And that refers to things like you know, uh, minimizing the number of deaths that occurred, that they caused, um, or even completely denying that a genocide occurred. Right? If you distort the consequences of what your actions were, then your actions you know, probably weren't that bad. So we just discussed some ways in which individuals and groups are able to justify for themselves and to others why they did what they did. And these can be used by orchestrators of genocide to convince groups to participate in these violent acts, right? An additional psychological tool that these instigators um, and orchestrators can use to their advantage is to focus attention on stressful societal conditions. And this, this goes back to when General Dallaire was talking about how he's seeing this kind of fear um, in, in people throughout the world, right? So this stressful societal condition, this feeling of uncertainty and fear, okay? So individual societal factors, they don't operate in a vacuum. I think we all probably know that to a certain extent. They interact with each other on, on many levels. And one element where we see this type of interaction, it's in times of uncertainty and loss of control. People don't generally like uncertainty. I'm gonna venture a guess most of you on this call, myself included, don't like uncertainty, don't like chaos. It's just generally uncomfortable, right? It elicits stress, it elicits fear. And research has found that people in unstable societal circumstances are more likely to be attracted to ideologies that offer a way to restore some sense of stability and control. And the instigators of these genocidal policies offer what may appear to be remedies for this uncertainty. So people who feel they've lost control over their lives, they tend to prefer simple solutions over complex ones. It's just the way human beings are wired. Um, and they're willing to turn over control for getting to these solutions to people they see as strong leaders. And these leaders use that to their advantage and they present options for trying to regain control and shifting the power back to the in-group. So, We've discussed the psychological construction of the other into this us versus them, which is that integral piece, that dehumanization of the other, which is necessary in addition to the us versus them thinking, the role of uncertainty and loss of control, and the ways that individuals can build these cognitive structures to keep themselves believing that they're actually acting in accordance with their morals. They justify it to themselves, to other people. And one final piece I wanna talk about today is how obedience and conformity fit into this puzzle. So under what conditions will ordinary people come to follow orders to commit extraordinary acts? And most of us probably know of Stanley Milgram um, and his studies on obedience, but some may not. And so he conducted these famous studies in the 60s and 70s, focusing on the conflict between obedience to authority and personal conscience. And he aimed to determine how far people were willing to go in obeying instructions if it involved harming another person who was seen as an innocent person. So his, what his original study do, did was it paired two people together. One was a participant blind to what was happening um, and one person was a Confederate. So the Confederate knew what the study was about was working with Milgram, but the participant did not know that. They thought the Confederate was just another participant with them. 
So at the beginning, they draw straws to determine who's going to take two different roles, the role of a teacher and the role of a learner. But this was rigged, of course, so the Confederate always comes out as the learner. This was done in, um, in a uh, laboratory setting. There was also another person in the room dressed in a lab coat um, who was acting as the experimenter. So the Confederate person in on the study is strapped to the chair in his role as the learner, and he's got electrodes strapped to him. And after he learns a list of word pairs that are given to him, the participant, right, in this role of the teacher, tests him by naming one word and asking what the paired word was. So the participant's told to administer an electric shock every time the Confederate makes a mistake and gets the word wrong. And that each time it happens, they have to increase the level of shock that they give. So there's 30 switches total on the shock board. They're marked 15 volt from 15 volts, which says slight shock, all the way up to 450 volts, which is marked as danger, severe shock. So the participant can see this. So the Confederate gives mainly wrong answers on purpose. And if the participant then refuses to give a shock, the experimenter, the one dressed in the lab coat, gives him a series of orders to prompt him to continue. I'm saying him because this was all men involved as subjects in the study. So what the findings were, were that two thirds, 65% of the participants actually continue to the highest level, the 450 volts, that danger severe shock level. And all participants, 100%, continue to 300 volts, at least 300 volts. These findings indicated that people were likely to follow orders given by an authority figure, right, the person in a lab coat, even to the extent of harming another human being. And if we think about this in terms of, you know, individual explanations for the, the behavior, we would think, okay, it might be something unique to that particular person that led them to do that and follow the orders. But in this study, everyone obeyed up until the 300 volt mark, right? And the, that the person who was sitting there getting shot, the Confederate was screaming, was yelling, was obviously in pain. So another explanation might be that the situation that these individuals were in influenced them to behave in the way that they did. When you think about it, you know, obedience to authority, it's ingrained in us from when we're young, from the all through when we're brought up. People tend to obey other people if they recognize them as authority figures, whether it be in terms of legal authority figures or moral authority figures. So some examples, police officers, firefighters, your parents, um, religious leaders, bosses that you have, right? So this is kind of ingrained in us as human beings as we're socialized. And keep in mind too, in this study, in Milgram's study, the elements we've discussed today throughout this presentation weren't even in place, right? There was no dehumanizing. There was no effort to create an out group. Um, there was no societal or individual uncertainty or stressor that the person was contending with. Right? This level of obedience happened even without those pieces in place. So Milgram did some follow-up variations on this study um, where he kept everything the same except the specific situation or condition that the, partic the participant was placed in. Um, in the interest of time today, I just want to highlight one. It's in bold here. Um, so there was a, a social support condition. And in this condition, there were two additional participants, both Confederates, both who knew what was going on, that were also acting as teachers alongside the main participant. But these two additional people, these two new Confederates, refused to obey the commands of the person in the lab coat, okay? So Confederate one stops at 150 volts, Confederate two stops at 210 volts, right? They just refused to go on even after the additional prompts. So in this, in this um, condition, this social support condition, with the presence of these other people in the room refusing to obey, right? They were seen to disobey the authority figure. The level of obedience in shocking up to that maximum voltage dropped to 10%. And if you remember, it was 65% in the original study. So this points to that, to the influence that social support and peers refusing to obey orders to commit harmful acts can actually have on a person. So everything we talked about today, these are all psychological processes that can be applied across people, across situations. They're not unique to violent or extraordinary acts. They're underlying social psychological processes. And so keeping in this in mind, I wanted to share this quote with you from sociologist Zygmunt Bauman. 
He said, quote, the most frightening news brought about by the Holocaust and by what we learned of its perpetrators was not the likelihood that this could be done to us, but the idea that we could do it, unquote. And so with that in mind, I'd like to leave you with, with two final questions to ponder um, when you leave here today. So how can we counter us versus them thinking? And how do we structure our societies, families, schools, et cetera, to redefine the world as more inclusive as opposed to restricted to a select group of people? So basically that in-group, out-group phenomenon. So Dr. James Waller, who I brought up earlier in the presentation, is a social psychologist, he's a keen state, University. Um, he's also a professor of Holocaust and genocide studies. So he noted, he had an interesting quote um, that I want to share. He said, quote, we should be less concerned about the bad apples, individual dispositions, and more concerned about the bad barrels, structural situations, unquote. So in order to focus on those barrels that Dr. Waller refers to, we need to be thinking about these types of structural questions, right? So it's important that we study the individual factors, the individual dispositions, the bad apples, that's definitely important. That plays a role too, but we can't neglect these structural questions and these structural features as Dr. Waller calls them the barrels. And so I thank you for your time um, and I look forward to your questions in the Q and A. Fantastic. Uh... Dr. Perry, thank you so much. Uh, next up, and just a reminder, the Q&A will be after all the panelists in panel one have spoken, and then we'll open up to Q&A. You can write your, uh, type your questions in the Q&A um, key or box on the bottom of Zoom. Uh, Dr. Raquel uh, Perez, you are next. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining in. Uh, first, just all of the conversations that we've been discussing and going through today tie in so well with what I'm going to be presenting. We already have heard that there are really no borders, and that's the angle that I'm going to be presenting. So let me tell you a little bit about myself before we kind of dive in. So I actually have a PhD and master's in conflict analysis and resolution. And though most of my work focuses on conflict from the micro to the macro, especially within organizations, systems, processes, and communities, I've also ventured out into very much of a tech space. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with the term, but there is a new concept that's being presented, which is called peace tech. So peace tech actually focuses on using technology in order to help us either alleviate, de-escalate, understand, or inform of where conflicts are beginning processing in our different spaces. So when we take a look at peace tech and, and these different elements, it's important to understand that it's emerging technology, right? So if we use any piece of technology to help de-escalate, if we use a piece of technology to help build awareness, if we use a piece of technology as an alert system, that becomes the arena in which we then operate. So with peace tech, it's, it kind of helps us move into different elements of technology. So I will be talking about VR. And so before I dive into the actual project in VR and what that means and looks like, I let me go ahead and kind of unpack what that is. So we, we blanket them under a house called XR, which is extended reality. Now, augmented reality is something very similar to if you're shopping at Ikea, you use your phone to see if this fits in the size. Some of you may have children in your family, maybe even some adults that will then use augmented reality to play games such as Pokemon Go. VR is actually when we place a headset and it brings us into an immersive space. Okay, so everything around you, it, it can either be through 360 film video. So it's going to be like a live kind of show that we would watch on TV. And the same would be for, for the immersive would be more of a digitally created space. Okay, this is going to be very important as we kind of move forward. Then MR is basically the two mixed together for a different type of experience. So that being said, let's talk a little bit about the project. So I have a VR project 
called Storytelling for Social Change, Voices of Genocide. And just for a little bit of a timeline on that project, uh, this actually began probably in, a, in 2018, 2019, where I wanted to create a VR experience that would help connect and tell stories of genocide. Uh, after much research, much connecting with individuals in the, the industry, I actually was able to partner with the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in DC. And they said, hey, we have this whole repository. You could definitely have access to the information there. So in the design and development of this, I was able to secure grant funding and build out an actual VR project. Now, because there are stories of genocide, there are a lot of elements that I had to take into account. This wasn't something that, it, it wasn't a video game that I was creating. This, and I understood the weight of that as I was moving forward. So one thing that I, I want to definitely note is that we've already had, and I'm, I have these pieces here, we already had some discussions about dehumanizing and, and Dr. Perry did a great job about that. The reason why this layer of media, as far as external, these extended realities were so important, is the more and more I interacted with students as a faculty member at Florida International University, the more and more I realized that there was a disconnect between aware, awareness and experience. See, as we watch TV, as we watch movies, as we're exposed to more things on social media, we sense to, we sense to create this false narrative that if I've seen it, I understand the experience. And that's not necessarily true. If we look at the recent natural disasters, uh, South Florida, unfortunately, we were impacted by a hurricane. So though many people saw the hurricane and elements of it on TV, it's completely different than actually living through a hurricane. So when we decide to tell these stories and these narratives, it's important to understand that we need to tell some to build awareness, but not create the false narrative that I'm an expert in that experience. And unfortunately, that is a lot of what media does. As Dr. Perry says, this also builds in the concept of dehumanizing, right? If we take a look at something on TV enough, on a movie enough, through scrolling through our social media, it's not important enough for us anymore because we're desensitized. And the individuals experiencing that, it's not real for us. So we didn't want to create an experience that detached people from, from the actual happening and events in those time moments and places. Uh, one of the earlier on, events that I had for my students was we were we went to a museum, the Holocaust Memorial here in South Florida. And it was interesting to me that the students were, were in shock when they got to meet Holocaust survivors. And they were like, this was so unreal for me because I've only read about them in stories in school or in, in shows, never really understanding that they're real people. So this became my task. How do I tell a story effectively, giving honor and respect to those and their experiences to not sound like the experts and at the same time, have the user connect with what's taking place. So we first have to dive into a little bit of the design process of the experience design process. And that takes us over here first. So there's the user interface, which is our UI, and user experience. And so we're going to really focus more on the user experience side. You see, this is the traditional model of how user experiences are built out. But this was going to be different here. Because even though I have to keep the user experience in mind, I had to keep the actual stories of the individuals intact in a way that could be honored. So I approached this as there were actually two users in every single one of these elements. It was the person that was putting on the VR set, and then there was the person that I was honoring their story. So I had to constantly think of how do I do this in a way that is respectful to that end and allows the user to connect. Then as I proceeded, how can the user then engage with the actual individual in that experience, right? And what were my overall objectives and how was this going to be used? So for the engagement component, I opted to go the route of 
focusing on listening. So I wanted the user to be able to go into the experience, the VR experience, and be able to listen to the user's story, be, be able to stop and not be distracted by a, a lot of, of items around them. During my research and following along into so many different other VR experiences, specifically that focused on genocide and Holocaust, one thing that was interesting when I spoke to the developers was that sometimes the user would get lost in all of the imagery. They would be taken back by the picture. They would be taken back by those pieces and almost miss out on the reasoning. So what I wanted to do was have the user connect to the individual experience through listening. So that became those kind of pieces. My objective was to build active listening skills, compassion and empathy, and understanding in the process, not to a place where the user felt that they were an they were the expert in these genocide narratives, but one that focused on, I now have a, a greater understanding for what took place as a human being and usability. So this made sure that as I was building out this project, that it was transferable, it is something that would be able to be shared and that users would have an easy time accessing the actual interactive virtual realm. So this brought me into three different psychological considerations. So for the user experience, I focused on stories. I started first, and in grant, this is a plan of a larger rollout. This is the beta of the actual project. And so my, my first focus was actually Holocaust survivors for the simple fact that the resource was so readily available and ready for us to connect with. Uh, the plan and hope is that we would be able to capture more narratives and connect with more stories so that we can then begin to tell those individual stories as well. So for the user experience, we didn't want them to feel overwhelmed by that imagery, but rather connect to the stories that they were hearing. So that led us into what environment are we going to be hearing these stories? And this was extremely challenging because in virtual reality, I could create any type of environment, but every piece was crucial. So I experienced a lot of concentration camp walkthroughs, which were stunning and amazing and visually un unreal. And it transported me there into those spaces. But again, that imagery would sometimes become overwhelming and I would lose sight of what the narrator was showing and demonstrating along the way. The same thing can be said when I decided to go into a natural environment. I was very specific that I couldn't do natural environments, let's say of a forest per se, because there were a lot of victims of the Holocaust that when they went to, ride, to hide and flee, they ran into forests. So even that level of sensitivity in this development was crucial. And so as we were taking a look at what these spaces can be like, we experienced so many different options and we ultimately landed on an open space. And we'll show a demonstration of that in just a moment. Now, the impact of this was, was interesting because we needed to figure out how the user would connect with these stories in that time and space. And there are VR experiences that, that had hiccups along the way, which they were definitely the pioneers in this for me. So I, I do appreciate that. But there were some VR experiences, for example, that would have you be a prisoner in a concentration camp, digging a grave for corpses around you. And understanding that they wanted to give the user this impact of this is what it was like, it wasn't thinking of the other user, which is that survivor, and what that could do as far as traumatizing an individual, the user, and within that story and process as well. So what we decided to do was to have the user leave a recorded message for the survivor or for the story being presented so that this was a way that they could connect and interact with one another. So as we went through each one of these spaces, it was crucial and important that we brought the user along, again, not to make them the expert, but to build that understanding and connection through that auditory space. 
So now I'm going to show you a clip from the actual interaction. about the soldier saying goodbye and it was for us not the soldier but anybody saying goodbye because we were constantly saying goodbye to each other well, because and he says he doesn't think he, he that doesn't they think that they'll either. ever get together again and uh, so this is what was sung also That's right. They were killing us and we were singing. Isn't this, isn't this a scream? Yeah. So as you see, in the experience, it's designed to be in that moment and to hear that powerful story, that these were humans that went through this process. It wasn't something that was focused mm -hmm. on, it wasn't something that was focused on on just the, the physical impacts, but that these were human beings and bringing to that place. At the end, the user then gets to connect with the orb and actually leave a message. This message then goes into a SoundCloud where we then have the information and are running it through for that, for the data and, and for the key words that show empathy, compassion, and gratitude for sharing that story. So again, our hope is that this connects individuals to the humanistic aspect of a genocide to make them understand that these are not just, you know, boundaries, right? These are not just state national boundaries, that these impact people's lives on a daily basis. So I am looking forward to any of your questions. I know that this is a lot. Technology is a little bit different, but it's important for us, especially as we go forward in the work in conflict and genocide, that we take a look at how our technology and these different spaces can lend and support us in our efforts. Dr. Perez, very, very profound. Thank you. Um, please. Um, I'm sharing now. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, you you definitely blew my mind. That was amazing. Uh, <laughs> so again, uh, Q&A will be right after Dr. Don Themey, who is next. So Don, when, Don Themey, whenever you're ready. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just before I start, I want to once again remind you that these are my own personal comments, and these are not in any way reflective necessarily of the United States government, Department of Defense, uh, United States Navy, and Naval War College. So, you know, as you've, you've heard from all the great comments over the last hour and a half, what I want to try to bring us towards today is thinking about what we can't know and then trying to figure out with sort of some reverse thinking what that might mean. And we can never really know what others are thinking, and, and just as important, absent the immersive experience that those decision makers had, we can never really truly fully understand or appreciate the thoughts that person or a group of people made at the time the decision was made. 
Now, nonetheless, accepting that risk, I want to explore three different things today with you, if you'll give me the honor of your time and your attention, um, realizing that in many ways, the people who are victims of these uh, acts, you know, aren't here to share their history with us. And so we have to really think hard about that. So these three things are the relationships between perpetrators, victims, um, bystanders, and the actuators of violence. Our roles as citizens, historians, and educators, and then the intent, the will, and the actuation of fighting back in myriad forms. And I want to preface this with two personal examples. Uh, the first is from 1996 when I took a older gentleman, I gave him a guided tour of uh, the Auschwitz-Birkenau complex, and you know he had jumped into Normandy in 1944. You know, so he was a pretty rugged paratrooper kind of guy. At the end of a long, cold, snowy day, uh, as we're trying to warm up, you know, and get ready for the drive back to Krakow, um, he turned and looked at me and he said, so why didn't they fight back? The second comes from my father-in-law, who recently died at the age of 92. Um, he survived beatings by the Hitler Youth. He survived being shot at by the Waffen-SS. Um, he survived an orphanage where he's one of two survivors. Uh, the Nazis rolled in a few hours after he ran away and killed every man, woman, and child. Um, but he then spent the rest of the war hiding potatoes along routes where the prisoners marched to and from the concentration camps, uh, stealing coal from Nazi trains, you know, throwing it off the side so the people could have a little heat or be able to cook a little bit of food. Um, he fought back as best as a small Polish boy could in the face of oppressive and highly effective terror as both a victim and a bystander. And he was anything but passive, and he fought back as best he could, even as multiple family members were imprisoned and killed in Poland. Now, what you see here is a relative's personal Ausweis, uh, or sometimes called a Kenkot, uh, from Nazi-occupied Poland. And that's one kind of wall that makes divisions between you know, perpetrators, uh, bystanders, victims, and witnesses. But it's just as important in its own way as the physical wall that you see depicted next to it. And the reason I use this picture is not because I know anybody in this picture, but I want you to see how big these walls were. And I want you to understand that when you hear someone talk about the walls that were put up, there's at least two kinds of walls. There's the walls you've heard about of stereotyping and scapegoating. Okay, but there's also bureaucratic administrative walls and there's also physical walls and combined all together, these make things pretty hard. And so if you pick up Hilberg or Jan Gross or Daniel Goldhagen, you'll see where all of them have wrestled with this and tried to, to figure this out. Iris Chang did the same in her work, okay, with excruciating detail in the violent interactions in the Asian theater of operations during World War II. Adam Reisky uh, and others have covered the difficult nuances of occupied and Vichy France in uh, World War II. And then, of course, in Armenia, uh, the actions of the Turkish government uh, and their soldiers is chronicled, perhaps best in Balakian's The Burning Tigers. But each of these scholars and countless other historians and educators have willingly shouldered the burden of trying in some way to convey the lessons encountered from these and many other events to our children and to our future citizen leaders. Now, in each of these four examples, one in Asia, one in the Ottoman Empire, and two in Europe, the roles, responsibilities, authorities, and missions of governments, armed forces, and non-aligned civilian actors are covered usually with a focus on perpetrators and victims. What is important to us is the psychology of the mostly men who committed these actions. You know, while interpretations and opinions differ, what emerges is that this is an organizational yet profoundly human action set. And the results of this are far from uniform as indicated for, uh, by one example from Police Battalion 101, uh, the subject of uh, Browning's work, you know, arriving at Josefu from Biwagrai early one morning, uh, July 12, 1942, at a point when Barbarossa seemed to be going pretty well for Hitler, uh, Major von Tropp, who was the battalion commander, said that if there was anyone who felt themselves unable to participate in the task for the day, that they could step out of ranks. Uh, one person did. The company commander began to yell at him. Major Trapp cut him off, at which point another 10 to 12 men stepped forward, and they were told to report to Major Trapp, turn in their weapons, and wait for other assignments. Now, if we take a look at this, a lack of time for reflection combined with the pressure of conformity and then reinforced with copious amounts of alcohol, nonetheless meant that the rest of the battalion proceeded with their grisly task. 
The perpetrators were not uniform in their backgrounds, their beliefs, or their actions. But those actions here, as in Nanking, Vichy France, and Armenia, resulted in a series of killings for which the word genocide was created to cover the enormity of the killing. And so we have another thing that I like to call the responsibility to educate. This ground has been well, if uneasily trod by battalions of scholars, researchers, and museum docents over the past century. But as the last witnesses of these acts of the early to mid 20th century leave us, it's up to us as citizens, historians, and educators to attempt in some feeble manner to portray not only the actions of the disinfection caprale, the trigger pulleys, and the machete wielders, but also those whom Hilberg grouped as victims and bystanders, and to try to answer that paratrooper's question. What is the psychology of those caught up in the chaos of war with concomitant crimes against humanity and genocide as they try to survive in a radically altered new life situation? These are individual actions that are often decided in mere moments, whether smuggling food and coal, making a quick choice to hide someone in your attic, your basement, or your barn, or deciding to court favor with the oppressors to include you know, denouncing supporters or hiding places. These actions are all fiercely individual and they are consequence laden and there is as consequence laden indeed as any decision a human being will ever make. They are literally life and death and not just for the targeted population. Young women who took up with the Nazis in uh, France, you know, after the war were humiliated. In Poland, the penalty for helping a Jew was death sentence for your entire family. My point is that the stakes varied and they had to be made under duress, the likes of which most of us can barely imagine. And this makes the psychology of Hilberg's victims and bystanders harder to contemplate and perhaps grasp glimpses of understanding through the maelstrom of malice that enveloped Europe during World War II, China during Japan's invasion, and Armenia during the actions of the Turkish government in World War I. Now, Hermann Langbein's People in Auschwitz and Josef Karolinski's Fighting Auschwitz provide some excellent primary source references to the people who were in the most well-known of that camp, but a camp of more than 2,200 total camps in the Nazi concentration camp system. They provide a great insight into the lives of the victims in what was a hybrid camp, both a work camp and an extermination camp. Now, I can tell you that listening to my mother-in-law, who is herself a survivor of three different concentration camps, the survival instinct is strong, and it drives people subjected to this industrialized oppression to both heights of altruism and depths of despair and every other point along the spectrum of possible human reactions, emotions, and actions. But they cannot tell the full story, because while there are survivors of Auschwitz, Treblinka, Dachau, Mauthausen, and Belzec, the vast majority died there, leaving only remnants of their experiences to be told by others who shared their experiences, but had a different outcome. Thus, the psychology to endure, persevere, and find some small triumph, even if only in seeing another sunrise, is different than anything that we ourselves can know. Rather, the challenge for us, the bystanding participants of the present, is as faithfully as possible to recount those experiences and to seek lessons inside them without appropriating or exploiting them. We cannot and we should not pretend that we understand. The result of all this is what I have come to call historical empathy in allowing for what we cannot know and therefore suspending the easy judgments on those who in the main are no longer here to account their own personal points of remembrance. Another way to express the difficulty in recounting these experiences is to look at the reception of the escapees from Treblinka who made it back to the Warsaw Ghetto who in the main were not believed. We have the dubious luxury of knowing what the outcome was, but to the crowded, starving, lice-ridden, and confused inmates of the ghetto, they were confronting systemic eliminationist processes the world had never seen before. So we would do well to recall the warning of Pierre de Dalnuque. If you were a leader in the Warsaw Judenrat and a survivor who left the Umschlagplatz a few days ago somehow survived and managed to walk 50 miles back to the ghetto, just to warn you, what would you say? The same goes for Chinese leaders outside Nanking, French and Jewish leaders in Southern France, or Armenian leaders in Yerevan. There's no doubting the look of horror and the dirt and possibly the blood on the speaker, but how does one accept, process, 
integrate and then make decisions about this new information. How difficult it is then for us in the present to attempt to recapture, comprehend, and distill that information for a new generation of citizens, students, scholars, and policymakers. Now, with regards to bystanders, a loose grouping at best, but one that works as well as can be expected in this chaos, it's a fluid group. Browning, Goldhagen, Gross, Hilberg, and many others all have different perspectives on this. What we can say is that whether one drives the train from Drancy or watches Turkish troops marching east towards Armenia, or reads the New York Times in July and November of 1944, all of these people are in some manner bystanders. Depending on where one was, at what time in the evolution of any of these four action zones of genocide, one's individual perceptions and decisions on what actions to take or not take will differ. Under the right set of colliding conditions, bystanders who become active participants or choose to remain passive, itself a decision, each had to make life and death decisions that not only might affect the fate of the directly persecuted, but might also directly affect the fate of those who chose to get involved, whether in smuggling weapons, hiding people, passing messages, or pretending not to notice panicked people scurrying to hide and escape. Everyone brings with them to that moment of fateful decision, a lifetime of experience, bias, and prejudice. There are in fact many instances of righteous people taking action, whether in China, France, the Ottoman Empire, or occupied Poland. There are also instances, all too many regrettably, of individuals or group of individuals who in some manner became hilfwilligen to the designs of malice, the SS, the Ottomans, or the Imperial Japanese Army in China. Now, one facet of this convoluted history is the recollections, perceptions, and ex post facto justifications of those bystanders participants and potential Hilfiligan after the war. No one wants to stand up and admit complicity and culpability after the winds of fortune shift and one's actions are exposed to the harsh reality of accountability and all too often a brutal victor's justice. Even today in France and Poland, these are emotional dynamite conversations to have. Just recently in a review of the book, uh, The State Against the Jews, one person interviewed in France about the fate of the French Jews and the French collaborationist regime opined, well, they could have resisted. Well, yes, in 1945, that probably seems to be a logical statement. It's probably a logical statement for someone who's looking at it today. But if you were to put yourself in the dark days of November 1942, probably not so much. So while Hilberg is useful, Gross reminds us that the bystander's appellation is more complex than a single bucket or a data point. Like Goldhagen, Gross's work is based on a lot of research. And in the case of Gross, it's actually a lifetime of work. The Smolchownice or the betrayers of Poland were certainly there and their motives are as individual as each bystander who became a perpetrator of betrayal during the war and perhaps a victim of some form of justice after the war. But to buttress the arguments of Gross, and let me be clear, I do not entirely agree with all of them, the Kielce pogrom after the war only adds fuel to the fire to the degree of complicit Polish anti-Semitism stoked by myriad historical, cultural, and sociological factors. To be fair, in Soviet-occupied post-war Poland, the Soviets did in fact arrest 15 perpetrators from, uh, from Yedwabne. Okay, and perhaps the most important statement that comes out of all of Gross's research is when he was talking to one of the, the witnesses, it's what I call bystanderness. And this person said, quote, everyone who was in the town on that day, July 10th, 1941, less than three weeks after Barbarossa commenced, and in possession of a sense of sight, smell, or hearing, either participated in or witnessed the tormented deaths of the Jews of Yavlovna. So this involvement, this witnessing, took place in thousands of roundups, killings, deportations, property expropriations, not only in Poland, but across France, China, Armenia, and many, many other places too numerous to list here. For example, in Turkey, the temporary law of deportation and confiscation brought another aspect of bystanderism uh, that has to be considered. When any government, whether it's Vichy, Ottoman, or a ruling occupier such as the Japanese in China or the Nazis in Poland, issues laws that have enforcement mechanisms to back up those words with oppressive action, it's another layer of complexity with which each witnessing bystander must deal. We all struggle with parsing the difference between cooperation and collaboration, and those decisions had to be made every day. 
Every bystander is not just a benign bump on a log. By their very presence, they are participants faced with challenges and forced to make decisions as to what actions to take or to not take. This extends over time, perhaps symbolically culminating in the betrayal of Anne Frank's family in August of 1944, after the Allies were already well ashore and on their way to liberating Paris and the rest of Europe. At the same time, even as the uprising in Warsaw raged and Allied tanks approached Berlin from both east and west, the Luj ghetto's 69,000 inhabitants as prisoners were put in trains, sent to Auschwitz, and killed. So against all this, against all hope, what makes people fight back, either individually or in organized groups and movements? For some, it's almost cultural in their DNA. While Gross and others are correct to note that there were schmaltz of Nietzsche in Poland, there were also literally thousands of documented bystander witnesses who became not willing helpers of the Nazis, but willing helpers complicit in some ways to the Poles, whether Jews or not, on the run to survive. The same is true in all of our other examples. I can tell you after nearly a decade of living in Europe, most of it in Poland, and married into a family of Polish immigrants, it's hard for me to think of a culture more predisposed to resistance to every possible form of authority, whether in huge Catholic masses, peasant uprising, or a thousand and one acts in between on the spectrum of complete, total refusal to yield to foreign oppressors. The French underground, the actions of missionaries and diplomats in Turkey, the actions of expatriates and others in China during World War II all underscore an aspect of the human condition to fight back even if only in fatalism and desperation. So I'd like to conclude then with two examples, which to this audience are probably well known, but I think they bear repeating. The underground resistance movement Auschwitz and the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising show that the human spirit, even in the face of the most complex, industrialized and bureaucratically structured mass execution of any targeted population in the recorded annals of history, it may bend, it may break, but somehow it self-organizes and fights back even in the midst of literally life and death furious debates about one's duty to one's God, communism, nationalism, and those words so often lightly bantered about or perhaps even mildly despised, patriotism and valor. So the first example comes to us from Mila Oshinastia, Mila 18, the command bunker in one of the final fighting positions of the Jewish ghetto uprising in March of 1943. After vigorous, really vigorous debate about the implicit responsibilities of Amida and no small amount of altruism and outside assistance from the Poles separated by decree and by walls, small groups of imprisoned Polish Jews decided that a fighting death was their preferred actionable choice. They held no illusions about their personal outcome, and they decided to set an example for those who would survive by whatever means, by putting paid to the lies that somehow the Judenrat and other Jews were complicit in their own execution by the Nazi regime. Their 28 days of revolt ended, but their example endures forever. And in so doing, they not only set an example for members of their faith, but for others as well, witnessed a year later when all of Warsaw was to be convulsed in another 63 days as the entire city attacked the Nazis and fought to the bitter end. The second example comes from what Yusuf Garolinsky called fighting Auschwitz. There was a vibrant organized resistance inside of Auschwitz almost from the very beginning of its existence as a prison camp for Polish political prisoners, priests, intellectuals, and other potential leaders in April of 1940. Initially a camp just for the southern regions of occupied and so-called general government of Poland, Auschwitz quickly became a camp with prisoners from all over Poland and then Europe. In September of 1940, less than a year after the war started, Witold Pilecki purposely walked into a roundup in Warsaw so that he would be sent to Auschwitz, where he planned to organize a resistance movement inside the camp. Prisoners there executed internal spies. They cultivated typhus-infected lice, and they placed them in the coats of Nazi guards in the camps, in effect, targeted assassinations that spread fear amongst the guard population. The resistance inside Auschwitz by the prisoners in the Sonderkommando doomed to die resulted in the blowing up of gas chamber and crematorium number four on October 7th, 1944, the remains of which can still be seen today. So I'll leave you with this. Just because a war is over, it doesn't mean that state-sponsored oppressive terror ends. After my father-in-law jumped ship and illegally immigrated to the United States, 
the Soviets in Poland locked up his half-brother in the Gulag for 10 years. When he returned with my wife during Stan Wojen, a martial law in the 1980s, his name was still on a list held by the Polish Soviet directed security police. That's courage. It's an unbending will, a drive to not only do the right thing, but to bear witness and to transfer that witness first to his daughter, Lily, and a decade later to his son, Daniel. We who by the purpose of immigration or the fate of birth inherent that spirit of unceasing resistance, owe it to our fellow citizens and to our children to carry it forward in a meaningful manner. As the Poles have said for centuries of partition and occupation, so long as that spirit prevails, despite all the risk that it entails, jeszcze Polska nie zginiała, which, oh, by the way, just happens to be a refrain of the Ukrainian national anthem as well. Thank you very much for the privilege of your time and your attention. Dr. Themi, that was very powerful. And I love the way that I, I feel that the three panelists were stringing pearls with each other because those pearls or those themes, common themes, uh, created the common thread and enhanced it. So thank you. Uh, we will now turn to Q&A. Um, and I believe we have one question. I'll read it and we'll see how the panelists want to respond. So the first question is, of the people that were under brain study, so I guess this is to Dr. Perry, do you think there is a difference or there are differences of education level or IQ as compared to those with minimal education? Could it be possible for strength that part of the brain to alter responses during the study? Okay, I will, I will try that one out. Um, that's an interesting question to ask. So as context for that particular study, the subjects were, um, students at Princeton University. Um, so that probably wouldn't have been a good thing to study in that particular um, group. But um, I, my, my initial reaction is I don't think that would have anything that would have an effect. That's just my opinion though, because um, different areas of the brain and different processes of the, in the brain are related to um, intelligence than are related to the things we were talking about. Now there's, there's some debate in the neuroscience community over whether it's a part of the brain or whether it's brain waves or, or um, how strong neuroplasticity, like the flexibility of any one, of one person's given brain is, whether the, which of those things or something else control um, or most influence IQ and intelligence. But I, to the best of my knowledge, I haven't heard of the areas that we talked about in the brain today being one of those things that's under debate. And so I'm not sure there would be there would be much interaction. Again, just my opinion, and I am not a neuroscientist, so I could be wrong there. Um, but that would definitely be um, an interesting piece to study. And I know there was another question on there. What did I forget? What was the second half of that? I'll read it. Uh, second part of it was, could it be possible to strength? I think they mean hmm. strengthen that part of the brain to alter responses during the study. Yeah, sure. That's a great question. And so I don't, I don't know about those particular regions of the brain, but one thing I do know in, in other research that's being conducted in an unrelated area, in the area of mindfulness and attention studies right now, um, there are neuroscience studies that are showing that neuroplasticity, that flexibility within the brain to, um, uh, to allow for you know, growth or reshaping of different parts of the brain has been found when there have been certain levels of practice or learning of specific um, tasks and materials. So in, the, in that case, it, it's related to attention, like paying attention. Um, so I, I'm wondering and, and thinking maybe that would apply then um, to these other areas of the brain. Again, I don't know for sure, but that would be my, my thought is that if this neuroplasticity um, is, you know, is effective in the other lobes, I'm thinking in like the amygdala, prefrontal cortex, things like that, for other areas like attention that it may also hold in this case too. I just don't know for sure, I'm sorry. No, that's great, thank you. So um, 
that was it in the Q and A uh, written questions. But I would like to go on and ask Dr. Themi and Dr. Perez. I saw and heard a very strong um, link between the two of you regarding storytelling and memory and the importance of that. And so can you share, Dr. Themi, um, now that uh, you, have, you have mentioned your in-laws, mother-in-law and father-in-law, how, whatever you, you are comfortable sharing with us, how are you continuing the memory in your lineage, in, uh, in, in the future generations? Well, I guess the, the first thing I would say is it's really, really, really tricky. Um, so I've probably spent 50 days of my life in Auschwitz, um, giving guided tours, doing family research, you know, whatever, you know, and I, I went there once with, with a guy who was an actual Auschwitz survivor and he stood in front of a, a particular spot in Birkenau and said, this is, this is the building in which I was in prison. That may be true. The records indicate that that was always in the women's camp. OK, that's not to say on one day that there wasn't a shift in policy or somebody was moved here and there, but the records don't match his memory. OK, that doesn't mean he's wrong. All right. It doesn't mean the records are wrong. It means, you know, even um, as frequently precise as the Nazis were in trying to document their work uh, and their crimes and everything associated with it, you know, there can be gaps in that. Right. So the first thing is you have to be really, really careful. Um the second thing is you have to try to be as true to the story as possible and, and give it as much validity as possible. And my, my mother-in-law, who's you know, now 90 uh, and, and going blind, you know, has been trying for several years now to you know, write down her memoirs. And some of the other family members have gone through it and said, there, there's a great Polish word, um, which basically means nonsense. And so now there's this big family debate going about, well, I don't seem to remember that way. And yet, you know, you can't tell her that her memory is wrong, just she saw it from a different perspective. So I, I think the best way to answer your question is, is to give everyone, whether it's your own family members or, or anybody else, to give them every opportunity to, to encounter, um, to educate and to immerse themselves, you know, in as much of this as they can take. Uh, I've taken my family to Auschwitz twice, um, you know, and well, I do the same thing with graduate students when I took uh, then First Lady Clinton there, told her the same thing. You know, there is no proper response. Everybody has a very unique response when they encounter this. There's no right or wrong response. Um, and at one point, you know, uh, on one of the times I took my family there, you know, my two older children turned to me and said, okay, dad, we're done. Okay, we're done. You know, let's walk out. Um, that doesn't make them bad. It doesn't make them good, it, but it makes them keenly aware of themselves as a human repository of that story. And then how do they want to carry that forward? Um, and it's, it, it's not easy, you know? Um, and so trying to instill a sense of respect Especially in our family, it's really hard. You know, my wife is the daughter of Polish immigrants. I'm half German. Um, that leads to some interesting discussions. Uh, you know, the other, other half of me is Scottish, so there's a temper that goes with all that. But yeah, you basically you do the best you can, but you have to expose them to as much as they can take and then let them make their own decisions and then try to help them grapple with what they think they understand and how to carry that forward, if, if that makes sense. Thank you. And Dr. Perez, what kind of feedback have you gotten from both sides? Well, it all depends. And that's a great question. I will say, um, just to piggyback off those pieces, the, the biggest piece is that the stories can't stop being told. Um, and I think a lot of times there's this fear of, you know, how accurate or how, you know, these elements. And so let's just not tell the story. That can't be an option. Uh, and I think uh, to your point, it, it, going into your question now, it's we're going to have to start figuring out new ways to tell this story. So, and that's where this, this merging of peace tech and using it to continue this, this narrative into different spaces and places that historically we haven't kind of ventured into. So the population that has predominantly experienced this has been... Um, college students and K through 12. 
And it always seems to be the same piece. First, I debrief them uh, before they go into the experience. And a lot more so actually in how their body is going to respond in sitting still and listening, believe it or not. And I'm like, you're going to feel uncomfortable for a second. You're going to, you're going to wonder, what do I do with my hands? Like, are they supposed to be scrolling or typing or doing something here? And no, I want you to sit and listen. So the first story, they, they're kind of a little jumpy. We debrief and then they go back into another story. And by the second or third story is where you really begin to see the layering and where they begin to compare story to story and say like, I had no idea, you know, from this population here, we even have one story of an American soldier who was captured and they get to tell their story. And so in that comparison, we're seeing that empathetic voice, that compassion, and that these are real people. These are not avatars that we created. These are, it's not, you know, a show or a movie. This is something that happened in real time and we're experiencing it in a different way. So the feedback that it, it's, it, the feedback has been consistent in that there, this level of compassion and like, that must've been horrible or that was so sad. And in K through 12 specifically, I, I always have that level of gratitude because the teachers usually go back and have them do an assignment, like a reflection and to carry that on even more so. So I, I think it, it's one of those pieces that I didn't, I didn't anticipate the amount of connection that they would feel. So I, I, it, it's one of those elements that it, it, it needed to be done. And I'm excited to see how else this can grow and evolve in each iteration. Thank you. Sounds like a success story. Please continue with that project. It's very important. Um, before we go to break, let me just ask the panelists, do you have any questions for each other? No? Okay. I'm seeing no. <laughs> I'm seeing heads shaking, no. So uh, we will take a 10 minute break now. And I wanna thank you again uh, to the three panelists. You did a fantastic job. And uh, I will see you after the break, 10 minutes. Thank you. Welcome back everyone. Uh, we will now carry on with panel two. And that consists of Dr. Ben Kiernan and Dr. Ansar Harun. Uh, we will begin with Dr. Ben Kiernan whenever you're ready. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this uh, discussion. I see um, the psychology of genocide as um, related very closely to the causation of genocide. And I'd just like to step back for a minute and talk, talk about two types of causes of genocide. There are the long-term causes, such as war, poverty, political instability, economic depression. These are the kinds of factors that occur in history which allow genocide perpetrators or genocidal groups to recruit supporters and come to power and conduct campaigns of genocide. These are what I call the long-term causes of genocide. Historic events that uh, allow uh, genocidal movements to recruit supporters and come to power. Then. A second category is the intermediate, uh, sorry, the immediate causes of genocide. Very different from the long-term causes. The immediate causes of genocide are the actual decisions made by leaders of genocidal movements to conduct campaigns of genocide, having come to power or while they are in the process of striving for power. They make decisions to carry out uh, genocidal policies. Now, that's a very different uh, kind of uh, causation than the long-term causes that have enabled them to recruit supporters and, and come to power. So I want to focus on these immediate causes of genocide, what I call the mindset of genocide perpetrators. And I want to emphasize that I'm dealing with a different level of perpetratorship 
than those people discussed by Leanne Perry in her important paper about um, the more ground level uh, participants in genocide. Here I'm talking about the leaders of genocidal movements who make the decisions to implement policies that they have come up with uh, to get their supporters to follow their orders and carry out genocidal policies. These, what I want to look into are the, the mindsets of these genocide perpetrators at the top level of movements uh, and what motivates them to conduct these policies, to give their orders to carry out genocidal policies. Now, uh, there are a number of uh, components of this genocidal mindset, in my view. And when these uh, components become clear, either in meetings or minutes of meetings or in speeches or in diaries of these uh, genocide movement leaders, uh, they are, if you like, um, uh, signs of the possibility of future genocide taking place. So they are, in fact, useful for predicting and even present, uh, preventing genocide. Uh, and these are the, the components that I believe uh, those kinds of motivating factors that drive leading genocide perpetrators to give orders to their followers to conduct genocide. Uh, I'll just outline them briefly and then I'll go through them one by one, uh, giving examples from a number of different uh, cases. I, I note that John uh, Themi in his interesting paper gave uh, examples from China, France, Poland and Armenia. Uh, I'm going to give examples from the Roman destruction of Carthage, the uh, Euro-American settler genocide of the Pequots here in Connecticut, where I'm speaking from, uh, the Russian, uh, imperial Russian 19th century uh, extermination of the Circassians uh, in the mid 19th century, uh, and then uh, the Nazi case uh, and uh, the Cambodian case. Uh, the first part of the genocidal mindset uh, that I want to discuss is racism or religious prejudice or targeting, uh, not necessarily the same as prejudice. Uh, and I'll explain why uh, in a minute. Uh, and to take uh, an example that's well documented from uh, the ancient Roman dis destruction of Carthage, uh, I want to quote you from a speech made by Cato the Elder when he would regularly stand up in the Roman Senate and argue Carthage must be destroyed, Delenda est Carthago. But what was his motivation here in urging that policy on uh, the Roman Senate and polity? He would say when one of his last Senate speeches, who are the ones who have often violated the treaty? Who are the ones who have waged war most cruelly? Who are the ones who have ravaged Italy? The Carthaginians. Who are the ones who demand forgiveness? The Carthaginians. He focused constantly on emphasizing the Carthaginians, not necessarily as an inferior race, but as an enemy, uh, targeting the Carthaginians uh, at large. Um, the, a similar policy uh, was used by the Euro European Euro-American settlers in uh, the 17th century in Connecticut, uh, when they targeted the Pequots, the Pequot Indians uh, during the Pequot War. Uh, uh, the policy was adopted briefly, but definitely, that uh, no more shall any Pequots uh, use that name. The Pequot race, uh, the Pequot people shall no longer exist. Uh, and this was a policy that was not long after overturned, but in the meantime, uh, huge numbers of a uh, large proportion of the Pequot uh, Indian population was uh, exterminated. Uh, in the case of the Imperial Russian mid 19th century uh, 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 extermination of the Circassians, uh, 
well described in a recent issue of Yad Vashem Studies by Yehuda Bauer. Uh, he quotes two Russian generals putting their policy. One of them said, we need the Circassians land, but have no need for the Circassians. And the other one said, annihilating the Circassians is an aim in itself. So you can see the targeting of an ethnic group very clearly there. I don't think we need to uh, go into much detail to uh, describe the uh, Nazi regime and Hitler's targeting of the Jews, uh, the Romani or Gypsies, uh, in, the, in the way that the Nazi regime carried out the Holocaust and the genocide of uh, Romani people in, in Europe and uh, against other groups as well. But it's very clear that racial or religious prejudice and targeting was definitely involved there as well. Now, in the case of Cambodia, uh, the Pol Pot regime had a very similar policy. If you just bear with me for a minute, I want to quote from the radio of the Phnom Penh regime of, of Pol Pot which broadcast in May 1978. Each one of us must kill 30 Vietnamese. So far, we have succeeded. Using these figures, one Cambodian soldier is equal to 30 Vietnamese soldiers. We should have 2 million troops for 60 million Vietnamese. At that time, the population of Vietnam was about 55 million. However, 2 million troops would be more than enough to fight the Vietnamese because Vietnam has only 50 million inhabitants, unquote. So this was broadcast on the radio. It went on, we do not need 8 million people, the population of Cambodia when the uh, Khmer Rouge took over. We needed only 2 million troops to crush the 50 million Vietnamese and we still would have 6 million people left, unquote. Not only is this uh, radio broadcast, show a, an intent to crush or kill all 50 million Vietnamese, but to sacrifice 2 million Cambodians in the effort to do that. Uh, there are other uh, details of the genocidal uh, programs of the Pol Pot regime against ethnic Vietnamese. Uh, one it, who were in Cambodia at the time, the mi minority population, uh, of ethnic Vietnamese in Cambodia who were wiped out uh, in 1977 and 78, uh, almost to the last. Uh, and that couple of dozen ethnic Vietnamese may have survived, maybe fewer. Um, it was considered necessary by the Khmer Rouge to kill even the children and babies because they would, quote, grow up Vietnamese. Uh, and so this was a genocide that was found uh, to have occurred and uh, the uh, deputy to Pol Pot, Nguyen Chia, and the head of state of the Pol Pot regime, Kieu Samphan, were both convicted of the genocide against the ethnic Vietnamese, uh, and both uh, lost their appeals in the uh, extra extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia, the UN-sponsored uh, tribunal uh, recently. And so their convictions stand. Uh, and another genocide, conducted by the Pol Pot regime against the Cham Muslim minority in Cambodia, uh, Nguyen Chia was found guilty and convicted of uh, that. So the uh, ethnic prejudice or racist prejudice and targeting of ethnic groups uh, was uh, an integral part of the Khmer Rouge rule. Not only that, but that racism was uh, extended, if you like, or introverted against the Khmer majority population to which the leaders of the Khmer Rouge themselves belong. And they, they targeted the population of the Eastern zone of Cambodia, who were nearly all of Khmer ethnicity. And they called them Khmer bodies with Vietnamese minds. Kluan Khmer, Kuo Kabal Yuan, Yuan being Vietnamese. They were accused of being contaminated by the Vietnamese supposed Vietnamese way of thinking. So that racism became uh, interpolated into uh, the Cambodian ethnic group itself. So it's very clear that in all five of these cases I've mentioned, 
and many others, which I discuss in my book, Blood and Soil, A World History of Genocide, that uh, racism or religious prejudice or targeting of ethnic groups uh, is an integral part of uh, genocide in nearly every case. Second is plans for territorial expansionism. Obviously, in the case of the Roman destruction of Carthage, uh, the conquest of Carthage was an imperial Roman expansionist military exercise, which was successful in 146 BC. Uh, it was urged upon the Senate by Cato, uh, and although there were some opponents of it, uh, Scipio Nasica in particular would always get up and say the opposite to Cato, but eventually the Roman uh, Senate dispatched uh, a military mission which destroyed uh, Carthage. Um, the same uh, it, uh, territorial expansion was uh, evident in the destruction of the Pequots in Connecticut, uh, and the land of the Pequots was uh, seized and, and was taken for uh, white settler colonialism. In the case of Imperial Russia in the conquest of the Circassians' land, uh, the statement I read before by the Russian general, we need the Circassians' land, but not the Circassians at all. Uh, it's very clear that this is about a territorial expansion. Uh, I don't think, again, I need to explain uh, why we can describe Hitler as an expansionist regime, Hitler's regime as an expansionist regime. Uh, he obviously uh, uh, was one of the major cases of that in the 20th century, if not in, in history. Less well known is the fact that the Pol Pot regime in Cambodia was also uh, an aggressive territorially uh, military power, uh, which not only attacked Vietnam across the border, uh, but also attacked Thailand and even Laos. All three of Cambodia's neighbors came under mil military attack uh, by the Pol Pot regime's army. Uh, and uh, although the uh, regime did claim territory in Thailand that historically, uh, as long ago as the 16th century, had been part of the Angkorian Empire, the Khmer Empire, and still included a large Khmer-speaking minority within the borders of Thailand. Uh, the Khmer Rouge decided, I think probably under Chinese pressure, uh, to uh, uh, diminish their military aggression against Thailand and concentrate on attacking Vietnam, refusing in 1976, again in 77, and again in 78 to negotiate with the Vietnamese and continuing their attacks. And again, these were based on a claim to the Mekong Delta, part, a large part of South Vietnam, which many Cambodians call Lower Cambodia or Kampuchea Krau. And many Khmer Rouge leaders uh, in public, and in private made uh, the, the assertion that uh, Kampuchea Krom, the Mekong Delta of Vietnam, belonged to Cambodia. And these attacks were in part an uh, assertion of that uh, alleged right that Cambodia had. So again, we're talking about a plan for territorial expansion, which fits all the cases that, of genocide that I've um, discussed. Uh, so we... Uh, We've talked about racism or religious prejudice, territorial expansionism. The third factor that I want to mention is what I call a cult of antiquity. That is looking back at the past and glorifying the ancient past of an ethnic group uh, and, uh, and uh, seeing it as a model, uh, if not to be copied exactly, perhaps to be surpassed, but definitely to be, uh, to be glorified. And, uh, and this, again, uh, does seem to uh, be uh, present in uh, these cases that I'm discussing today. Uh, Cato himself talked about, wrote, wrote history and talked about Roman history. He uh, proudly recounted uh, his claim that his, uh, his own forebears were descended from hardy ancient Spartans. Uh, he had a respect for uh, ancient Roman history be before his own time. Um, the settlers 
who uh, took up arms against the Pequots in 17th century Connecticut, uh, actually used the, the um, precedent from the Bible of the destruction of Amalek as the um, uh, justification for their destruction of the Pequots, uh, just as uh, the uh, ancient uh, biblical city of Amalek had been destroyed. So the Pequots must be destroyed as well. So again, you're looking at the justification of a glorious past uh, in, as, as a, an excuse or a verification of genocide. Um, I think in the case of the Circassians, uh, the Imperial Russian uh, ideology, uh, which has been in some ways reinvigorated by Vladimir Putin and his attacks on Ukraine, looking back to the Imperial Russian past, uh, I think that's, that's clear what, we're, what we uh, are seeing now to some extent. And I think that existed in the case of the Circassians as well, looking back to the Kiev Rus and the uh, long ago history of the, uh, of the Russian people. Uh, Hitler too looked back at the ancient Germans, uh, bravery in their uh, confronting the Roman legions, the, uh, uh, the hero uh, Arminius or Hermann, as he came to be known in German and his destruction of ancient Roman legions was a, a favorite theme of, of Hitler. And in the case of Cambodia, the Pol Pot regime, as I mentioned, they glorified Angkor Wat as uh, they would say things like, if our people can build Angkor, we can do anything. Uh, they, they did uh, uh, think that they could surpass the democratic Kampuchea, as they called their state, would be greater than Angkor but it was certainly a, a model that they, that they looked up to, a time of, of antiquity uh, that needed to be uh, restored. So this cult of antiquity is the third factor that I see as a motivating factor for genocide perpetrators in their mindset. Uh, and also in the mindset is the fourth factor I wanna mention, which is a, an agrarian ideology. And I wanna make the point that this is I'm talking about mindsets. I'm not talking about practice here. I'm talking about what drives the psychology of genocide perpetrators. The agrarian ideology, the belief, not necessarily the practice, that uh, farming and agriculture are a superior way of life. Not necessarily that they practice it themselves, but the uh, ideology of it is, is, uh, is what uh, drives a lot of them. So. It's, it's, it's very clear from Cato uh, in, his, in his writings that he talked about the farmer as the best citizen of Rome. Uh, he talked about merchants as murderers. He said, if you want me to praise money lenders, I might as well talk about murder, murderers. Uh, he was uh, very dismissive of urban life in his writings, even though he participated in it. I'm talking about the ideology here. He, 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 he talked about uh, agricultural life as the purest form of uh, human existence. Uh, again, the Pequots were, even though they did cultivate corn, uh, they were also hunters and gatherers, uh, and they were looked down upon by the uh, American settlers in, uh, in Connecticut in the 17th century as uh, they weren't using the land uh, as as uh, effectively as real farmers did, and they didn't have private property and uh, ownership of the land and so on. I think with the Circassians, we've got the Imperial Russian view that we need their land, we want to settle on it and so on. This, is, this agrarian uh, ideology is there as well. Uh, in Hitler's regime and the Nazi regime, it's, it's uh, quite clear that urban areas were, in Hitler's own writings, urban areas were considered corrupt and centers of vice uh, and uh, that the german peasant was uh, was seen ideologically as the uh, the center of german uh, goodness and superiority uh, and um, and again in the case of the pol pot regime in cambodia 
as we know, they immediately evacuated the cities of Cambodia into the countryside and put everybody to farm labor, unpaid, of course, uh, not, not peasant labor, but uh, unpaid forced labor in the countryside. Uh, they claim to be uh, not, uh, although they claim to be communist and were led by Pol Pot, a secretary general of the Communist Party of Kampuchea, uh, they did say things like, uh, there is some kind of worker class, but we haven't focused on it yet, quote unquote. Uh, they, they talked mostly about the peasantry, uh, although they put them to work as uh, unpaid laborers uh, and abolished peasant family life, peasant religion, Buddhism, and peasant land ownership uh, in practice. But uh, ideologically, they considered themselves to be implementing a regime that would benefit the peasants uh, and not the city people. And they didn't trust the city population whom they forcibly evacuated in the countryside into conditions of slave labor. So I think all of these four features, racism or religious prejudice and targeting, plans for territorial expansion, the cult of antiquity and the agrarian ideology, uh, are strong features in nearly every case. Now there are exceptions, um, which I think can still overlap with some of the more classic cases where all of these cases, all of these features fit. Uh, one exception is Stalinism, which uh, can uh, be seen as uh, presiding over genocide, in particularly in the Ukraine, uh, but other cases as well. Um, the Stalinist regime was definitely not an agrarianist ideological regime. It was very pro-urban. Uh, it, it gathered resources from the countryside by force uh, in order to uh, increase uh, uh, industrial life in the cities. Uh, it was it was definitely not what you would call an, an agrarianist uh, ideology or regime. Uh, and in fact, the Holodomor, the um, the major case of genocide of the Ukrainian people under Stalin, uh, was definitely anti-peasant. It was it was it was taking resources away from the Ukrainian rural population, even at the cost of millions of uh, dying of starvation, uh, three to six million, I believe the figures are there, uh, in the 1930s. And the uh, the it is quite clear that this was mostly used to um, industrialize the cities, these resources for which so many Ukrainian farmers died and their families. And so Stalinism cannot be seen as fitting this pattern, I think. Uh, the same with the cult of antiquity. It's not really there in Stalinism either. On the other hand, other Stalinist regimes descended from perhaps from the Soviet Union or related to it or modeling themselves on it, at least claiming to, uh, get closer to the uh, pattern that I've described. For instance, Maoism. Um, the uh, Chinese regime of Mao, with its great proletarian cultural revolution in the 1960s was definitely not uh, as pro-urban and anti-rural as the uh, Stalinist regime under Joseph Stalin himself had been in the Soviet Union. It was the, it's, it saw uh, the uh, dispatch of hundreds of thousands if not millions of people into the countryside, uh, at least ideologically, it was it was pro rural. Learn from the peasantry was one of the slogans, and so there's a, there's a Stalinist regime here under Mao, which uh, which was uh, drifting away from uh, and and at the cost of millions of deaths. Uh, and if we take an, uh, to a further remote uh, further um, remove. Uh, a regime partly descended from Maoism, that is the Pol Pot regime in Cambodia, uh, which uh, was very close to China under Mao and, and after his death. Uh, we, as I've seen, as I've shown, they, they evacuated the cities altogether. They went much further than Mao's cultural revolution, uh, to which it's 
not clear that they were loyal at all ideologically, but they went much further, evacuating the cities uh, and uh, and taking a very anti-urban, uh, what might be called a very anti-Stalinist position, while retaining features of Stalinism in in other cases. So the, even the exceptionists like Stalinism can overlap uh, in in different cases with the features that I've outlined, the four features of of the mindset of perpetrators of genocide. Uh, and I want to, uh, again, uh, just conclude with emphasizing that this is about the mindset. This is not about the practice of genocide. Hitler wasn't a peasant, uh, but he did uh, see ideologically uh, in some sense that the German peasant was uh, the perhaps a more reliable German than the uh, intellectuals or the city people. And to just give two examples of that, um, in the case of Darfur, uh, the people who committed most of the uh, killings of the uh, victim groups in Darfur were, were not uh, farmers, they were pastoralists on horses and camels. Uh, the ideology was there, but not the practice. Uh, in the case of Darfur. So, uh, but nevertheless, uh, I think that Darfur was a case of genocide uh, that uh, that has much in common with the other uh, cases that I've, that I've mentioned already. What mattered was the psychology. What mattered was the mindset of the perpetrators. And that's quite important in the immediate causes of genocide, the decision-making of the leaders of the regimes and movements that set in motion the genocide, uh, despite their having come to power through being able to recruit with the help of long-term disaster uh, structural forces such as war, poverty, economic instability and political crisis. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Kiernan. Uh, very profound and thought-provoking. Um, next, we have Dr. Ansar Haroun, and I just want to preface his talk by mentioning to the audience that uh, Dr. Haroun is a retired forensic psychiatrist, and his talk is going to have some intricate details about Freudian theories and philosophies regarding um, the psychology of genocide. And I don't want anyone to feel offended by some of the terminology. So please don't take this as a derogatory um, you know, uh, presentation. Uh, it is the language of Freud and it's the, um, it's the semantics that's used in psychiatry to explain. And so take it as an educational uh, an informational presentation. Uh, over to you, Dr. Harun. Are you there, Dr. Harun? He's in San Diego. <laughs> so there is a time difference. He was here. Hold on. Let me see if I can prompt him to get on. Okay, while we're looking for him, um, let me ask Dr. Kiernan a quick question and he can respond. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned Putin and his mindset. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the um, more, more uh, kind of focused characteristics of what he is doing, Putin is doing in mm -hmm. uh, Ukraine? that that are uh, indicators for us. Because uh, I was even asked early on this year, is this a genocide or not, what he's doing in Ukraine? And uh, mm -hmm. that changed from the beginning of the campaign to clearly what I see as genocidal intention mm -hmm. on the part of Putin now. So um, do, you, do you want to address some of that and uh, give us an idea of, of that mindset? 
and well, I'm, I'm not an expert on the latest uh, findings of the mass graves and uh, the, the targeting of uh, certain groups. Obviously, there have been uh, uh, crimes such as aggression and war crimes committed by the Russian forces in Ukraine. Uh, and I would also say it's likely that uh, crimes against humanity, uh, of which one is extermination, uh, that is a crime against humanity, which involves uh, the targeting of political and social groups, as well as ethnic, national, racial or religious groups. Uh, but it doesn't require the proof of the intent on the part of the perpetrator to destroy the group as such, which is very difficult to prove. And it is required to prove genocide. But in the case of extermination as a crime against humanity, uh, it's uh, not required to prove extermination. And I think the case uh, that the uh, Russian troops and, and Putin's forces, uh, and maybe Putin himself, uh, are responsible for the uh, commission of crimes against humanity, including genocide. Now, I'm not ruling out that genocide has also happened. It's much more difficult to prove, but the evidence that it might have happened uh, is uh, supported by some of the annihilatory rhetoric that comes from Moscow, from the regime itself, uh, and has for some time. And I think that rhetoric uh, includes that the, the claim that uh, Ukraine is not a separate country, it doesn't have a right to exist, uh, and that this idea uh, goes back to Imperial Russia. Uh, that I mentioned in the case of the Circassians in the mid 19th century under Imperial Russia and the genocide that was committed then. Uh, the idea that uh, the Ukrainians and the Russians are really part of a uh, similar, if not the same uh, state, the same political culture. And Ukraine doesn't have, according to this claim, that can be. Uh, derived, that derives from imperial Russian claims uh, that, that Ukraine doesn't have the right to be its own country and culture and language and uh, polity. And uh, I think that could be uh, buttressing the force that is being used illegally, contrary to international law, and uh, conduct and, and, and uh, increasing the severity of the war crimes and crimes against humanity and possible genocide that uh, has been occurring in Ukraine. Thank you, Dr. Kiernan. Um, I'm sure we can talk even more about that during Q&A. Uh, we do have Dr. Ansar Harun ready to go. So whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Okay, how do I get my slides, uh, Hayat? Do you want me to do them at my end? Sure, yes, because I, okay. I didn't okay. realize, I thought you would be, you know how to do it, and I don't. Uh, so okay, no problem. Um, sure. Charla, I need to share a screen. So, yeah, here we go. Do you all see it? Fantastic. Okay, Thank you. good. And uh, Dr. Harun, just tell me when you want me to advance the slide. Just say I will next, tell you. Just say no. next slide. Okay. Sure. Uh, the first slide is a um, sure. Can you just position the slide a little bit? Um, so I think that's actually, great. Actually, I cannot change the positioning. Oh, okay. So that looks pretty good. Let's go to the next slide then. Okay, so that's actually we we, we can't see much of the um, the material. Is there a way to? Um, yeah, I think, um, let me try to walk you on how okay. to share your slides. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Because that'll be easier. So on cool. the bottom of your screen, do you see yep. a, do you see a green button that says, says share screen? Yes, I do. Shall I click? Yes. Click on that. I did. I've do clicked on that. Do you see your slides? Um, I can see, uh, or your desktop. Uh, yes, I can. I can see various okay. uh, 
I can see screen, whiteboard, iPhone, launch meeting, what's new and Okay, inbox. so Dr. Harun, on the bottom okay. right of that window, it should say share. So click on share. Yes. Shall I click on that? Yes. Oh, now I've got Zoom sign in. Okay, now where are your slides? You need to put your slides up. Oh, um, so how do I? You need to open your, your file. Open my files. Um, For the slides. Ah, hang on. Um, I'm not sure how Bear to Bear with that. us, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everyone. That's okay. Um, you know what? Uh, I will, I okay, come out of this, go to the top and say, stop sharing slides. Um, uh, let me the green, that. the- Okay. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, is that- No, no, that's not it. Go all the way to the top of your screen where okay. there's a green area. It says new share. Is that it? Oh, stop share? Yeah, stop share. Stop okay. share. And what I'll do time. is I'll share your slides at my end and then I'll talk through what's on the sure. screen, okay? Sure. So okay. this is the sure. first this is the first slide that says the psychology of hate. Dr. Ansar Haroon, MD, retired. And I'm going to go to the next slide. It sure. says why study hate? Reasons and, from yeah, reasons yeah, from and, literature. And the rest is fine. Okay, go ahead. So, hello, audience, and um, thank you so much for inviting me. So, um, uh, I'm a, actually a forensic psychiatrist. I think I'm probably the only um, uh, forensic psychiatrist, and maybe the only psychiatrist on the panel. So, I share your interest in hate and genocide, um, and we can, of course, um, study this from different angles. So, I'm going to focus specifically on. Um, my area of expertise, which is as a psychiatrist. And within psychiatry, I'm a forensic psychiatrist, which means that I've been dealing with hate, or at least hateful behavior, for most of my life. So I worked in the courthouse, and my job was every day to um, evaluate perpetrators of um, extreme misconduct, usually violent misconduct. And I had to analyze that and explain that to the judge and the jury. And as you can imagine, much of violent, um, misconduct involves um, or is related somehow causally, correlationally, or in some way to hate. Um, and to my great surprise, hate is a, um, well, I don't know if it's a, a feeling or a cognition, very little studied in psychiatry. It is well studied in psychology, especially by um, social psychologists, political psychologists. But to my great surprise, it's, it's not really part of um, a study of, 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 of most psychiatrists. I'm surprised because, you know, to the question, why study hate? Um, I enjoy literature, and the very first literary canon in the Western imagination is that of Homer, the Iliad, and that starts with a discussion of hate. Um, theologians are interested in it. I teach ethics, and, um, you know, we can debate whether hate is good or bad. The conventional view is probably that hate is bad. But we can make a case that some hate, righteous hate, righteous anger is actually good. Um, in my field of psychiatry, hate can lead to extreme misconduct. And um, once I was an epidemiologist, and there may or may not be an epidemiology of hate, but you could argue there's an epidemiology of the consequences of hate. Now, shootings, for example, are probably related, probably causally to hate. So there are many, many reasons to study hate, and I'm delighted to be in an audience of people like you who I'm sure know more about hate than I do. Next slide, please. Perfect, uh, thank th you. Th this is definitions of hate. So I, I, I can read, you know, if we, if we don't get into it. Okay. So, so first of all, you know, the slide has to do, oh, thank you. With definitions of hate, and you'd think that hate, whatever it is, it's probably an emotion. Surely psychiatric taxonomies of disease like DSM or ICD would have something to do with hate. And um, actually they don't. So the DSM um, has discussions of um, other emotions, depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, stress disorders, you know, so many disorders. Hate is lacking, so there is no 
strict medical definition of hate. I talked about hate in legal settings like the courthouse. There is no legal definition of hate. There is a legal, legal definition of hate crime, but not of hate. But there are folksy definitions of hate from folk psychology, which we all know about. So I put it to you, the options include, is hate an attitude? Is it an action or a behavior? Is it an emotion? So probably most people think that hate is an emotion, a feeling state. But the alternative is that it's not an emotion, it's a cognition. So if it, if it is primarily felt, experienced, that would argue for an emotion. But if it's actually thought through, I think, I reflect what I want to hate, then that suggests it's a cognition. Whatever it is, let's assume that it is an emotion. It is unique amongst the emotions in that it is the only emotion that has an object. So as a psychiatrist, I deal with many emotional disorders. I deal with people who are depressed or anxious or stressed and so on. None of those have an object. There's no object to the depression. There is no object to the anxiety. There is no object to the stress. But if I diagnose hate, there's an object that is hated. The second, or the next thing to discuss is the voluntariness of hate. So now we move from psychiatry, psychology to perhaps philosophy. Is hate a no-fault condition or is it a fault condition? If I'm a hater, did I just end up this way? I mean, is this how I am? Nature, nurture, genes, environment, or however I ended up? Or did I create that condition in myself? So philosophers until about five years ago divided many, many such constructs, constructs into voluntary or involuntary, and now the new one would be non-voluntary. So I would love to discuss that. It's one of my pet areas of inquiry, but I don't have time. But I just want to bring to your attention is something for us all to discuss at a future conference. Is hate voluntary, involuntary, or non-voluntary? And then the last thing I wanted to come in the definition of hate, because we don't have a definition of hate, one reason we don't is that we can't agree on a definition. And I put it to you that there are many, many constructs, either emotions or cognitions that are actually imposters of hate. It looks like they're hate, but actually they're not hate. There's something resembling hate. So if I'm a psychiatrist and I want to treat depression, I have to know the definition of depression. I have to separate it from things that resemble depression, like anxiety. But of course, many of my patients have a mixed picture. They may be depressed and anxious. But a good psychiatrist will separate the two. So I'm not a good psychiatrist if I confuse depression and anxiety because they have a different neurobiology, they have different symptoms and signs, and they actually have different treatments. So again, if I'm a psychiatrist studying hate, I should study hate per se, and not the imposters of hate. Next slide, please. Thanks. So you probably can't see all the slide, but at the top left, the title is, who or what do we hate? So trying to be scientific, as opposed to folksy, I decided to do an epidemiological survey. I went to my family, and first of all, I asked my kids, who or what do you hate? So this is an N of three, and the answer is spinach. They hate spinach. And then I went to my wife. Um, I only have one wife, so that's an N of one. Um, and the answer is she hates spiders. So we have two objects of hate, spinach or spiders, which begs the question, is that hate? I mean, is that what we mean when we talk about hate, spinach? And spiders. So one of the elements of hate involves dislike. So my children do actually dislike spinach, and my wife actually does dislike spiders. But the second element involves some wish to harm. And my children do not want to harm spinach. And my wife actually doesn't want me to harm the spider. In fact, she always tells me to try and you know get rid of the spider without killing it, which causes 
um, me great pain because I have to um, stoop and, and, and so on. But let's move from a, a, a badly designed experiment to let me review the literature. So I'm going to put out to you some objects of hate throughout human history. And I think you can't see them, but they, you know, they are on the slide. So I'm going to give you four examples of objects of hate. I should add that I'm going to use language that is insulting, derogatory, unkind, and vulgar. And on the slide, I have put all these things in quotations. So these are not kind words I'm going to use, but deliberately provocative, insulting terms. So of the millions of objects of hate in human history, let me give you four. Let me propose to you that surely we all hate the fat so, F-A-T-S-O, the fat so. We all hate the pervert. We all hate the snob, the snooty snob. And we all hate the traitor. And at different times, all four of these have been bullied. Ah, oh, thank you so much, Lad. So now you can see those four terms. So if you actually look at human history, people have actually hated fat souls, perverts, snobs, and traitors. And what I'm going to do to you is use my background in psychiatry, and I'm going to actually use a Freudian model. I should warn you, I'm actually not a Freudian. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm actually a forensic psychiatrist. But just for the fun of it, um, of the many, many models of hate that we can use, I thought I'd use the Freudian model, or at least the, the model from Freudian development. Next slide, please. So, of course, I have to share with you that there are many, many ways to think of human development. On the left of the, of the, of the, of the slide, you have a common Indian way. The Sanskrit word is Purushastra, and the Sanskrit terms are, as you can see on the left, that's just to amuse you. I won't discuss those. They are you know, from the Indian uh, literature. So let's move to the right of the slide. And if you are, as I suspect, you are mostly more familiar with Western developmental theory. So you've probably all heard of Sigmund Freud. And according to Sigmund Freud, who started psychoanalysis, there are four stages of human development. And all of us go through these four stages, the oral, anal, phallic, and oedipal. And Good mental health is if you successfully negotiate all four of these, and the reverse, um, bad mental health can be if you do not successfully negotiate any one of these stages. Next slide, please. So let's take each of these stages in turn. So according to Freud, the oral stage of human development has to do, as the name implies, with oral gratifications. So chronologically, we start off as infants or babies. We experience the world, the world through our mouth. Orally, that is, the first pleasure we experience is the mother's breast. Um, it's nice and pleasant because, of course, it's soft, cuddly, warm, and it gives us the pleasure of milk. So that and you know, we want it all the time. Most of the time, of course, most human beings do get that oral pleasure. But of course, as we grow older, there are times we're denied that oral gratification. You know, mother may be sleeping, mother may be tired, or whatever. And of course, we get angry, we get irritated, we have a temper tantrum, and normal, healthy human development is successfully negotiating that. So if if we successfully negotiate the oral phase, we continue to enjoy the oral pleasures, anything to do with your mouth or pleasures, but uh, you know, we negotiate when we don't get them. And in my psychiatric practice, when I see the alcoholic who is fixated on the bottle of wine, the bottle of beer, you know, if I was an analyst, I would say, oh, here we have someone stuck on the oral phase. And you know, the treatment will or revolve around that. But there are oral vices, oral crimes, if you like. Of course, I'm exaggerating them. You know, of course, Freudian thinking can be, they can be mocked. So in this talk, a little bit, I'm just exaggerating you know, the, 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 mockery, the mockery of a Freudian position. So oral vices are when you misuse your oral pleasures. In other words, dirty foods dirty sex. 
So what are dirty foods? Well, actually, we live in a fairly enlightened society in the United States. We probably don't have dirty foods. Well, if I say to my American friends, do you eat dog? They would probably say, no, yuck. That's yucky. That's dirty. But there are, I'm sure if you ask an anthropologist, ask the world, well, they do eat dog. So in each culture, some foods are okay to eat, clean, okay, and some are not. So some foods are good, and some are bad or dirty. In, in, so in some Muslim countries, the ham sandwich is considered dirty. And if you eat it, yuck, you're eating something dirty. That's like an oral vice. Similarly, you can have um, other, um, uh, you can eat the wrong foods. So in India now, um, the Hindu right is associated with, there have been lynchings of people, mostly Muslims, who eat beef. So of course, beef is a cow, the cow is a sacred animal in India. And uh, um, there is one viewpoint, peculiar to the Hindu right, that anybody who kills a cow or eats beef is deserving of punishment. So eating the wrong food is translated or framed as killing a god. And that is a very serious crime worthy of a very serious punishment. And people who break that taboo have been lynched. So they are the victims of hate for either eating the wrong food or whatever. Let's move on to anal vices. So anal vices move from you know, the oral gratification to a fixation on dirt. So in Freudian development, the anal stages has to do with toilet training. Of course, all human beings um, uh, are toilet trained. Um, I don't think I've, been, I've never met a, an adult who didn't complete toilet training, but according to Freudian theory, there are people who's, who get stuck at that stage. So when you're being toilet trained, that often results in a, in a conflict. You know, the parent says, hey, sit down, you know, poo. And the child says, you can't make me poo. That leads to stubbornness and power struggles and so on. So the anal vices have to do with dirt and struggles. When it comes to, to hate, we come more to the emphasis on dirt. So dirty foods, like in, um, um, in many Muslim countries, ham or pork products are considered dirty or dirty sex. So of course, there's been an evolution in our thinking of what sex is dirty or not. And I have to emphasize that you know, I'm an American psychiatrist and I'm familiar with this evolution. So when I arrived in America for my psychiatric training, at that point, homosexuality was a mental disorder. It was considered a disease. The APA didn't say it was dirty, but it, ah, there's probably something dirty about it. It's certainly diseased, and you know, disease suggests dirt. And then in 1980, it was removed from the DSM. So now homosexuality, according to the DSM is not a, a mental disorder, um, but in the imagination of some people, um, uh, you know, there's something dirty about all things anal. And anal sodomy invites the uh, judgment that it is dirty, perverted, and those who practice it are victims, you know, deserving of hate. The next stage is the phallic stage in the Freudian development. Phallus, of course, is a, um, uh, I guess, a polite word for the cock, or cock is a polite word for the phallus. So the phallic vices would be cocky, arrogant, snooty, elitist, and so on. And of course, we all like to hate people who are cocky. And in the last election, you know, social scientists have, of course, discussed, you know, why Trump won that particular election. And one theory has to do with um, the social science analysis that um, some Trump supporters believe that Hillary Clinton's uh, use of the word deplorable, I think that was a term she used, um, you know, that meant that she was cocky, arrogant, elitist, and they were going to punish her because, you know, they weren't part of that elitist group. So you punish someone or you hate someone or whatever, for being cocky, arrogant. So that's, that's part of a phallus one. And again, continuing in this model, let's come to the Oedipal vices. So Oedipus, as you know from Greek mythology, um, Oedipus um, was a Greek hero. 
who was destined to kill his father and marry his mother. In other words, he had no sexual boundaries. So if you go to India today, um, one group that is um, uh, possibly the, being victimized, or at least there is a conflict between the Hindu majority and the Muslim minority. And of course, the East side abuses the other. I'm sure they say very unkind things about the other. And I'm sure there are many, many unkind things that Muslims say, say about Hindus. But for the purpose of this particular um, uh, Oedipal vice, I will illustrate it with one particular insult that the Hindu right labels against the Muslim minority. And that is, probably unknown to many Western audiences, that the Hindu right accuses the Muslims of marrying their cousins. And that is statistically epidemiologically true. It is medically true or epidemiologically true that it is more likely that a Muslim will marry a cousin than a Hindu. Um, I think in America, it is not, at least in California where I live, I think it is not against the law to marry your cousin, but I think it's not customary to marry your cousin. But in India, generally speaking, Hindus don't marry their cousins. Generally speaking, many Muslims do. So Hindus abuse the Muslims with this particular insult, you marry your cousins. And from that it goes to, you have no sexual boundaries. You'll sleep with anyone. Oh my God, you're so dirty. It goes from you marry your, your cousins to, oh my God, you'll even sleep with your mother, which invites the insult. Again, not my turn. I'm just using the insult to share with you, motherfucker, which of course is a horrible, nasty, ugly term of abuse. Two, and now this gets to be very relevant for our discussion. If you can sleep with your mother, oh my God, if you're a motherfucker, you can sleep with the enemy. If you can sleep with the enemy literally, you can sleep with the enemy metaphorically, which means you're a traitor. If you're a traitor, then you're definitely worthy of being hated, being feared, and being exterminated. So what I've done with you is I've given you one model, a thousand models for studying hate, and of the thousand I've chosen, you know, my field psychiatry, and within psychiatry there's a thousand models, but I just chose one. I thought it would be of interest to you, the psychoanalytic model. And so you can see the psychoanalytic Freudian stages of development, how hate can develop. Next slide, please. So what I've shown you now is that you can hate. You have these Oedipal vices, the oral vice, the anal vice, and so on. You have four types of vices, and you go to hate. But how does that lead then to, I mean, okay, hating is one thing, how does that lead to genocide then? So, and now I'll be repeating myself. I heard some of the very lovely talks in the morning and I'm just gonna repeat, but I'll just use my own language to repeat some of what I heard this morning. But pretty much it's the same thing. But I'll just give you a slightly different version of it. So as a psychiatrist, I would tell you that you're my patient, you know, you're just a normal, high-functioning human being. Um, you experience pain, of course you do. My life is full of pain, suffering, stress. Nobody is stress-free. So instead of stress, I'll use the word psychic pain. So you have psychic pain. Naturally, you want to reduce the pain and to increase the opposite, pleasure. You want to have a life of joy, pleasure, and so on. So I'm gonna tell you how that happens. One of the reasons that you experience pain is that when you look at yourself, you see your imperfections. You see you have warts, ugliness, fantasies, ugly fantasies. I'm a psychiatrist, so I've heard them all. Everybody has dark, dirty fantasies. I don't know who you want to sleep with, whoever you want to sleep with. Oh my God, you're all perverse, ugly people who want to get drunk and, and do horrible, nasty things that you'll never admit to. That is in your unconscious. You're probably not even consciously aware of it. Of course, I'm so clever that if you come to my clinic and come on my couch, I will drag it out of you. But until then, it's in your unconscious. And by definition, if it's in your unconscious, you're not aware of it. So the definition of conscious is that of which you're aware. So you're unconscious of it. But because it's in your unconscious, I'm a Freudian, I would say it's bothering you, it's niggling at you. And there are various things you can do. 
these problems, these wounds, these warts can actually express themselves in some symptom. So you might become a neurotic or you might fail the test or have a bad marriage or whatever it is that leaves you. But one other way is that you can remove the ugliness in you and it's called defenses. You know, you, you defend from that pain by, and there's a hundred defenses, but you use one particular defense of externalization. So you create the other. You are nice, clean, pure, wonderful, but you need an ugly model, the other, who is the opposite. You are clean and he's dirty. You know, the opposite of that. So first you create the other. So in every society, they create the other. So the Jew creates the Gentile, the, 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 the Muslim creates the Kafir, the, um, you know, the, uh, we're Americans, so we, we have citizens, we have aliens. I mean, even alien is, I mean, it's a respectable immigration term, it just means you, you're on a US citizen. But it's not a slightly derogatory term. I mean, if I use the word alien to my kids, they think aliens mean, for people who don't have US citizenship, but who come from outer space, you know, they're weirdos, they're, they're odd, they're, they're the other. So first of all, you create the other. That's the first thing. And the second thing you do is now you have the other, all the vices in you, which we discussed. The oral vices, the anal vices, the front, you know, you throw them on the other. So now the other has, is not only the other, is the ugly other. How convenient. Now that you have an ugly other, it is suddenly easy. How do you feel about the ugly other? So every time my kids watch a cartoon, there is the villain in the cartoon. He's always ugly, deformed. He doesn't look, look, look like us. I know in the video, I look short, dark, and ugly, but I'm actually tall and blonde and blue eyed. Everybody wants to look handsome. But in the movies, in our imagination, we are handsome. And the other has to be portrayed as ugly and worthy of hate. So you must create psychologically the other, so it is easy to hate the other. So now we have someone who is, it is easy to hate, except that, oh my God, there's something stopping us from hating. So whatever religion you belong to, damn it, there's probably something in your scripture that says don't hate. So because we're living in the United States, where the majority of religion is probably Christianity, I will quote from the Christian scriptures, which very clearly say, you know, don't be a hater, turn the other cheek, love your enemies. And there are, of course, similar sentiments in probably almost every, I mean, there are very, very few religions that teach about it. So somehow, now you've gone through that psychological work to create the other, to feel good, because now you can hate the ugly other, but, but you're not supposed to. Your scripture or your priest or your whoever tells you don't hate. Next slide, please. So now, the only way you can feel good is to make your hate righteous. So what a lovely English language term we have righteous. It's not quite right. So it's derived from right. But we don't say right anger. We say righteous anger. We've invented a new term. And the adjective righteous nearly always applies to things like righteous indignation, righteous anger. It introduces a moral tone to otherwise unworthy activities like hating. So usually hating is bad. Righteous hate, that's good. And in fact, the heroes of our society are those who experienced righteous indignation. When Jesus went to the temple and attacked the moneylenders, Jesus, otherwise a peace-loving person, wow, that's when he, it was okay for him to be angry. Righteous anger, righteous indignation. And similarly throughout history, we have so many people, Socrates, Jesus, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, we've all heard them. They got angry at times, but they got angry not when somebody insulted them, but 
they got angry over moral principles, freedom. They got angry at slavery or, or something bad. That's why they are heroes. So to experience righteous anger, you've got to convert your anger to righteous anger. Nobody quite says righteous hate. We haven't quite got to that stage yet. But that's what we really mean. That's what the hater wants. So he, with his tongue, he says, oh, I practice righteous anger. But Hitler would have said, I'm not ashamed of hating the other, the Jew. It is righteous hate. That's what he would have said. So now I just say to you, is that actually hate? Because there are other emotions that resemble hate. So when Marie Antoinette, in 1789, that, that, that's when the French Revolution happened. I forget when she ate too much cake or whatever. So when the peasants were angry that their sons didn't have bread and Marie Antoinette is eating cake, um, they probably hated her. I mean, eventually they cut off her head, so I guess they hated her. They hated her enough to cut off her head. But was it hate they experienced or, or anger? So as a psychiatrist, I think a scholarly psychiatric study of hate or the emotions that lead to genocide require a more careful separation of hate from the imposters of hate. So let's start with anger then. Do you hate the other or are you angry at the other? And there are enormous implications. So I'm putting it to you that hate is misused, it's become too broad a term. So there are pure examples of hate, which are hate, but there are many examples of things which are actually not hate, but ah, maybe something else. So because I'm a purist, I want to put to you, since you're scholars in the field, please help me identify those. So for Marie Antoinette, I put it to you, they didn't hate Marie Antoinette. They were angry at Marie Antoinette. How dare she eat cake when I don't have bread? Then. The anal vices, the sodomist, the pervert. Do they hate the pervert or is it disgust? Those are two different emotions. I won't get into it, but we will have a separate talk because I know one speaker did talk about the neuroscience of you know, what parts of the brain. So I put it to you that anger and disgust are actually probably going to have different parts of the brain that. You know, that are stimulated or activated. So disgust has enormous evolutionary biological value. Disgust developed to help us survive. So the reason that you and I feel disgust at feces is that our great great grandparents, of course, those who were disgusted by yucky stuff like feces avoided it, they got less disease, and they survived. And those fools who didn't feel disgusted feces, played with feces and probably got sick. So disgust is a wonderful emotion that has enormous protective survival value, but it's not hate, but it is used as a mask for hate. So as we heard this morning, Nazi Germany, the Nazis portrayed the Jews as disgusting, like rats. So were they hating the Jews or were they disgusting? Disgusted by the Jews. Then the third one is the third emotion that I'm proposing is it hate or is it contempt? When people, what was it about Hillary Clinton's use of the word deplorable that got some people to vote against her and to vote for Trump? They experienced, I put it to you, contempt. They felt devalued. So it wasn't, it wasn't hate, they didn't really, I mean, they may have used unkind words about her, but it wasn't, you know, if you really ask them, what bothers you about the elites? The emotion that bothers them is contempt. And it is contempt that is very, very damaging. I mean, as a psychiatrist, I'm telling you that you, you can probably handle anger, you know, with anger management classes. But one emotion that is very, very difficult to get people to forgive is contempt, to be devalued. And the last one, the, um, the, the Oedipal vice, 
the Muslims, you know, they sleep with their mothers, the motherfuckers, they sleep with the enemy, they're traitors. So many Hindu right-wingers in India think that Muslims are disloyal to India. They're worthy of hate. But is it hate or is it fear? Because if you have a group which is a fifth column, you probably do dislike them, but is it, I mean, it used to be passed out. Is it more hate or is it more fear? So I just wanted to share those imposters of hate with you. Hey, how am I doing for time? Because now I have a controversy about dehumanization, but I'm not sure if I have time for that. It'll take about five minutes. So how many more minutes do I have left? Should I move on yeah, or should I? About five to eight okay. minutes, if you can wrap it up. Okay, so then um, I actually have a discussion because I always like to give you something, the, the, the latest research. So since you're not a psychiatrist, I'm sure you read the social science literature, which probably you're very familiar with. Let me tell you something from the psychiatric literature because you may be less familiar with it. So you've heard this morning, and I'm sure you, you're very well aware of one of the theories or one of the pathways to hate. And that is the role of dehumanization. So I don't have to teach it to you, you, you obviously you already know it. But in, in one word it is that the pathway to getting people to hate is to dehumanize the object. That happened with the Nazis. So you, you portray the Jews as vermin, as rats, because they're dehumanized, it is morally okay to kill rats. It's not morally okay to kill humans. So that is, so in the last few months, and because I teach at UCSD, the research came out of UCSD, so I'm sharing it with you. The dehumanization theory has been called into question. So I, um, I, I won't get into that, but I just want to tell you that one of the new controversies in this whole year of research is the challenge to the dehumanization theory. But I'll move on, just giving you that. And next year's conference, we can talk about it more. You can ask Hey Arthur, I'll, I'll give you the reference later. So let's move on to the next slide. One second, I thought you were finished. Sure. That's why okay, I nope. stopped sharing. Hold on, nope. one I second. Forever. Hey, Arthur. <laughs> okay, next slide is here. Okay. Um, oh, so the one after this, this is the controversy one, which I won't discuss, but let's do the taxonomy. So, um, uh, yes, this is the slide, correct. Okay, so I just wanted to slightly contrast um, the theoretical social science research perspective that I suspect most of you have with my perspective, because I'm not a researcher. I, I'm a clinician. I actually see hateful patients and I talk to them and then I analyze their hate or their hateful emotions or their hateful conditions or their hateful behavior and then explain that to the judge or the jury. So, most of you in the audience and I come from it from slightly different angles, and you're probably less familiar, obviously, with my perspective, because that's not what you do for a living. So I just wanted to share with you that for me, hate or hateful behavior is too broad a term. So psychiatrists have a taxonomy. Actually, we have two taxonomies. So in case you don't know, I just want to remind you or share with you that we divide hateful behavior. So the common final pathway is a behavior, an act that is hateful. So psychiatrically, I analyze that into, is it instrumental or is it expressive? And for a psychiatrist, not necessarily for a social scientist, but for a psychiatrist that has enormous implications. So instrumental would be where the hateful act is done not because there is any emotion behind it, but the hateful act is merely an instrument to get an object. So I want to rob the bank. I go to the bank teller and I say to her, um, give me the money or I'll, or, 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 or I'll uh, harm you. So I don't hate her. In fact, if anything, I want to do it without without harming her, my, my act, coming in with a gun, threatening her, maybe slapping her, 
maybe a little bit hurting her, but not fully, is all instrumental. It is aimed only, the, 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 the bad behavior, the hateful behavior is an instrument for my, whatever I want, get the money. And that is contrasted with expressive behavior, which is that, you know, there's an emotion. I hate the, the victim or I'm angry at her or whatever. So this is often seen in rape. So expressive rape might be, you know, if I'm the, the nasty, brutal rapist, if I beat her up because I hate her or I enjoy it, that is expressive rape. But if I just cut her and say, I'm cutting you, so you know I mean business, the business is that I'm going to rape you. And once you accept to be raped, then I won't hurt you anymore. That was an example of um, instrumental violence or instrumental hateful behavior. And the second taxonomy is affective versus predatory. So simply, um, affective is hot, emotionally driven, and predatory is cold. And they have different neurobiologies. As a psychiatrist, of course, I study the neurobiology, different neuroscience, different treatments. So we, as a psychiatrist, if you have a problem with affective violence, I can treat you. I mean, there are medications that can reduce your urges for affective violence. But if, you are, if your violence or hateful behavior is predatory, I don't have any, I don't have pharmacological treatments. In all those implications. So if, if you're in social science, you don't know this stuff, I just want to open your eyes. I don't have time to get into the details, but just to whet your appetite for this, you know, the psychiatry of hate, if you like. Okay, let's move on so I can then, um, I think, come to the end. Next slide, please. If you can come to the slide that says blame, because I just wanted to talk about that. Um, ah, yes, this slide. If, if you can move it to the left a little bit, that'd be nice. Okay, so this slide is about blame. So, as I told you, there are many imposters of hate. We discussed anger, contempt, uh, disgust, and so on. One of them is blame, which we didn't discuss previously. So, if you if you're, if you're to commit a genocide, are you doing it because you hate them? because you blame them. Two separate pathways. There may be an overlap. Maybe you hate them because you blame them. There may be an overlap. But theoretically, those are two different constructs. You can hate someone without blaming them, and you can blame someone without hating them. So one obvious thing would be that if the, if the victim has agency, it opens the door to blame. If there is no agency, there's no blame. So if I, you know, if you and I have a car crash, you, the driver, a human being, therefore you have agency, therefore if you have agency, you have the power to make decision. If you decided to cut it in front of me and we had a car crash, I blame you. If you don't take responsibility now, I hate you. So if the car crash was because of, uh, it was raining and um, uh, you know, the road is skinny and I crashed into a, an object, well, I blame the rain, but I don't hate the rain. So obviously the presence or absence of agency determines that. But there are other factors, and they include a variety of cognitive biases. So there's a million cognitive biases that, of course, psychiatrists know about, or psychologists know about. And I forget whether social scientists know about them or not. I, I, I know that I studied them in med school and so on. But I just thought I'd bring to your attention because it's relevant to, um, to hate and to genocide. One particular bias, one particular cognitive error, the fundamental attribution error. And that has to do with the very natural tendency that you have the same behavior, but I'm judging your behavior. So if you are part of my tribe, my group, the in-group, my conclusion is that your error is based on some unfortunate circumstance. You're late for work. Two people are late for work. Person A is late for work. 
he belongs to my tribe or my group or whatever. Why was he late for work? Probably not his fault. I know he's having a hard time. His mother died last week or his car wouldn't start or there was a traffic jam. External problems. But when the other guy is late for work, he's not my tribe. He belongs to the other tribe or the other group. Why is he late for work? Huh. He's a jerk. He's lazy. He's disorganized. Why can't he get an alarm clock? It's his fault. So in the attribution of blame, and of course, as a forensic psychiatrist, I spent my whole life watching juries assign blame. It was so funny that my job as a medical expert was only to get the facts. I wasn't supposed to sway the jury on the side. My job was just give the medical facts. My expertise is in medicine. I'm a medical expert. But the attorneys skillfully use, of course, I could see all these tricks, race, religion, social class, all things that have to do with identifying the defendant as either you're one of us, in group, or not one of us, out group, which led to the jury deciding he is to be blamed or he's not to be blamed. Obviously, enormous implications for hating a group, hating in, in, in genocide. So, in medieval Europe, one group were the moneylenders. Why are they moneylenders? Well, is it their fault? Yes, it's their fault. They have a horrible religion, or they have horrible priests, or they, 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 you know, they don't believe in the right God, or they're primitive, or they're antisocial. They hate us. And the other explanation, it's not their fault. Um, no other jobs are open to them. We don't let them own land. They can't, own, they can't become farmers. They can't go to agriculture. There are very few fields that they can do. They can become doctors or bankers. So they, yeah, some of them became bankers. So the assignment of blame has to do with disparate cognitive bias, mental bias, or way of thinking. This one is called the fundamental attribution error. There's a hundred more of them, which of course we can study, and each one may or may not impact. So I think that ends my talk, and um, I think I'm within the time that you said. Yeah, that's just a summary of what we discussed. Discussed the code and vices to hate here, and, then, and so on. So thank you, Hayat. Dr. Harun, thank you so much. You gave us a lot to think about and digest and process. <laughs> so uh, thank you. Uh, we now will go maybe about 10 minutes into Q and A. Um, I don't see any written Q and A questions in the Q and A box, but um, I can invite uh, any of the panelists to ask questions to each other or to the last two panelists um, uh, or the audience, if you want to ask a question, please put it in the Q&A box, type in your question. So I will, I will throw out a couple of things, okay? So Dr. Harun, um, have you in your, your own contemplation come up with a definition for the word hate? Um, well, even, uh, I mean, first of all, I have not. I mean, there are many definitions you can use. So, I mean, a purist or a, a rigorous scientist, which unfortunately I'm not, would be free of all biases. Um, so depending on where I am, you know, if I'm in a legal case, I might come up with a definition that is applicable to that particular, um, that legal case. But very, very roughly, I mean, you know, the folks, you know, it's, it's like pornography. I forget which justice said that nobody can define the term, but we all know what it is. So, you know, even my five-year-olds know what hate is. You know, when they hate spinach, they know what it is. Although they're actually slightly misusing the term, the two elements which I think have to be present are, first of all, a feeling state having to do with negativity, Dislike, and then somehow, because you know you can dislike spinach, but probably a purist would say that you know that's not hating it. 
um, and then a wish to harm. So we somehow that, you know, we can obviously play around with those things. Um, yeah. It invites, it invites the, um, you know, can there be good hate? So that, you know, so what if you have Hitler? So, so Hitler things is, like, for example, I can hate cancer. You would hate cancer. Right. Um, but do you, well, I guess you do want to exterminate cancer. So they actually, yes. wow, you, you want to, <laughs> unlike spinach that I don't want to um, exterminate, cancer actually meets both criteria. Um, it begs the question, can you hate something that doesn't have agency? That, that's so a good, agency, that's a good point. Probably cancer doesn't, right. but by definition, all human beings do. And again, if you'll forgive me for coming in as a forensic psychiatrist, one of my commonest evaluations is that of insanity. So as you all know from the movies, even though it's statistically rare, but in the movies it's very common, but criminal defendants, everybody thinks the one way to get out of murder or some horrible crime is to plead insanity. So um, if you lack agency, you know, um, and you commit a hateful act. Yeah. Are you worthy of hate? So before that, are you worthy of blame? Mm -hmm. So many people would say that you can blame. I mean, you can blame an earthquake for causing a flood and the flood causes a car accident. You can blame it in a way, in a way that is causal. Right. But not a way that is emotional. You know, we don't get angry at earthquakes. But we do get angry at people who didn't service their car, and as a result of failing to service their car, the brakes failed and had a car accident which killed my kid. You get angry at them. Right. So anger is directed at people who have agency. Um, hate is directed at people who have agency. Although, as you said, you could probably hate cancer. Um, uh, but blame, I, it's a little tricky. Right. Um, the desire to punish. I mean, you know, nobody wants to punish the cancerous bugs. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kiernan, I want to ask you if you were able to extract anything from Dr. Haroon's presentation and apply it to some of the examples you gave us. Oh, well, thanks for that, because I was um, about to weigh in on um, <laughs> some of the uh, helpful uh, observations that I heard from Dr. Ansar Harun's talk. I, I particularly like the discriminate, discrimination between uh, hate and anger, disgust, contempt, and fear. I think they're all important uh, distinctions to be made um, in um, history and political science and analysis of the motivations behind uh, genocide uh, perpetrators and, and their thinking. But I also appreciated uh, the distinction between, um, if I've got this right, uh, expressive and what was the counterpoint to expressive? Uh, instrumental. instrumental. Yeah, instrumental and expressive uh, forms, uh, because I think that uh, helps me understand um, some of the psychology behind uh, different cases of genocide. I'm thinking of uh, the uh, article by Yehuda Bauer that I mentioned in Yad Vashem Studies, uh, I think it's number 49 last year, where he talked about the Circassian genocide by Imperial Russia in the mid 19th century. And he said it didn't seem to have any uh, racial prejudice involved. And as, uh, but he did quote the Russian. Uh, generals saying annihilation of the Circassians is an, is an, one of our aims or a central aim. I can't remember the exact quote, but I read it to you. And, and, um, and uh, Dr. Kiernan, you are frozen. But you hear me I, now? now, yes. Oh, okay. So um, I was talking about Dr. Yehuda Bauer's uh, discussion of the Circassian genocide and saying that there wasn't any 
uh, racial prejudice. I think that's the term he used. Uh, uh, I hope I'm not wrong about that. But I think what he meant was that the Russian generals who were intent on annihilating the Circassians didn't regard the Circassians as inferior. They did see them as a separate race uh, and they intended to exterminate them, annihilate them as they put it, but they didn't see them in a prejudicial way. It was uh, uh, instrumental, as uh, Dr. Harun mentioned. Uh, it wasn't expressive. Uh, they didn't see them as necessarily hateful. Uh, they wanted their land and they were going to annihilate them. Uh, and I think that's the difference between what I was describing as racial or religious prejudice or racial or religious targeting. It's, it's clear that they were targeted as an ethnic group in that case, the Circassians, uh, but there wasn't necessarily any prejudice against them, except that they were unlucky enough to be in the way of expanding Imperial Russia and they and their land was going to be taken from them and they were going to be killed in order to seize their land. And they were subjected to genocide. But I, I think uh, Yehuda Bauer was onto something when he said this wasn't like Hitler's hatred of the Jews or his description of the Jews as, a, as uh, inhuman or uh, Slavs as subhuman. Uh, the the, um, the description that, that you, you get from the Russian, Imperial Russian, description of the Circassians is that they were separate uh, and were being targeted for extermination, but uh, there wasn't much emotion involved. Uh, it, it was not expressive, but instrumental. And I think that's an important distinction. And I think it's one that's made in the Genocide Convention itself. The international law doesn't talk about the actual motive of genocide. It doesn't require proof of what the motive might be, whether it's racial hatred or economic uh, jealousy and seizure of wealth or, or territorial expansion or whatever. It just says there must be an intent to destroy the group as such, which is the case in both Nazi Germany against the Jews and in uh, Imperial Russia against the Circassians. The, the, uh, whether it's uh, instrumental or expressive uh, is not relevant to the law, but it is very relevant to the psychology of genocide, although it can happen either way. Thank so you so much. thanks for that insight. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, anyone else want to chime in? Yes, go ahead, Dr. Harun. Well, just just a response to that. Thank you for that lovely response. But I'm I'm sometimes asked why in India, as some of you may know, about ten years ago, there were some um, religious riots in the state of Gujarat, and uh, the victims of hatred there were treated um, especially brutally. Where pregnant mothers, um, fetuses were cut open and then put to the sword. Um, and these were often people who had been living together for centuries. So I'm asked as a forensic psychiatrist, why did that happen in India? And if there is hatred, contrasting what happened in Germany, where much of the killing, of course, I'm sure there was expressive hatred, was very cold. It was gas chambers. You know, people sat, uh, the scientists sat together and worked out chemical formulae. So it was cold, calculated scientific thinking the quality of, you know, how do we kill a thousand rats? So two different modes of killing or anger, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what is Nazi Germany and what is what happened in Gujarat? Mm -hmm. and, you know, both require, but, you know, that, that distinction between instrumental and expressive. So Gujarat and India would be a good example of fury, rage. Um, I mean, that you go to a pregnant woman because you're only going to decrease the population by one or two by doing that. Mm. It requires enormous psychological investment to cut open a pregnant woman and take out the fetus and butcher the fetus. Mm. I mean, it takes a toll on the killer. So you're paying a very, very high price for achieving that 
emotional relief. In contrast, what the Nazis did was it was so cold to me. Mm-hmm. So whatever Eichmann or Hitler or whatever did, you know, sitting in Berlin, happened far away in Auschwitz. You know, they didn't pay that emotional price, but they actually did reduce. You know, the result was they, they were very successful in exterminating what they would have said was vermin, rats. You know, they did reduce the population of the undesirables. So you're, uh, you're right. What a wonderful contrast. Yeah, I, I would say that um, what happened in Gujarat, I think it was about, about a thousand people were killed. Is that right? Sorry, in two thousand and one, maybe. Yeah, and and I would describe that as a genocidal massacre, um, and uh, and that Muslims in India are still under threat of uh, a genocide too, uh, as in China too. I think the Uyghurs, uh, but also I would add that in the Nazi case, uh, there was there were both phenomena uh, yes. existing. Absolutely. There was the the cold, calculated uh, scientific mass murder for which the Nazis are, are well known, but there's also what's called the Holocaust by bullets, uh, which which was going on on the frontier, uh, began very early in Poland in 1939 uh, with the invasion of Poland and, and spread across the uh, Soviet Union, including Ukraine. Uh, and, and there were very many uh, individual massacres uh, by by um, Wehrmacht troops as well as by the SS, particularly by the SS, and uh, I think they are more resemble more what you described in Gujarat uh, than than Auschwitz. Uh, I think there was a, a spectrum of killing by the Nazis that uh, killed almost. I think, in fact, um, I'm not sure of the the numbers, but uh, possibly as many were killed in in uh, face-to-face massacres by Nazi forces that, as, as were killed in gas chambers. I do have a question in the Q&A, so I'll read that. Bear with me for a second. Over the past decade, I've heard politicians say things like, quote, that's not who we are, unquote. This could be another way of saying who we are not which earlier in the session was used to explain how to distinguish enemies of the state, et cetera. Given the increase of violence in the country, such as the street riots in the summer of 2020 and crime in general over the past two to three years and groups being referred by political leaders as domestic terrorists and neo-Nazis, is a trend developing in the country which could be silencing and ostracizing opposing groups to gain political control. And I think they mean subjugating those opposing groups. I think this was directed back to me. I'm pretty okay, sure. go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to assume. I'm the one who um, early on had talked about the who we are not piece. Sure. Um, I think it can be used across groups. Um, uh, so, I worked for a bit at Facebook um, doing, led their Intel team on um, looking at dangerous organizations. And so we saw this um, when we would try to gather Intel from some of the more extreme social media sites um, that language like that was being used on both sides of the political extreme aisle. And when I say both sides, political aisle, I wanna make this very clear. I'm only talking about on the uh, on the fringes, on the extremes, right? Um, and so that kind of language can um, work to kind of ignite these different in-group, out-group pieces that, that we've been talking about. That's kind of the thread that's woven through all of the different presenters today, that in-group, out-group, us versus them, that othering. And so I do think the more that kind of language is used, regardless of which side is using it, if, if the question poses in terms of politics, Regardless of which side uses it on the on the extreme ends, um, I do see that as as challenging. It was something we saw when we would analyze um, threats uh, to you know to Facebook entities when I was there, which was what I was responsible for. Um, what when we saw that type of heightened language, that's when we would end up having to work you know with other agencies in terms of benchmarking and things because that's when the threat level tends to rise for the application of that threatened violence, right? Because people use threats of violence and 
there's not always an intent behind it to act. Um, but that's where we would see kind of the, the element for Intel to raise the threat level a bit when we would start seeing this, you know, more proactive othering, um, if you will. So. Thank you for that. And I think this is going to have to be the last question um, that's been posted. So it says, doesn't it always start with racial tension turned to hate and some sort of fear of the minority group? Who would like to address that? No one? Um, can I can I say something about that? And yes, and the, of course. The last the last question. Um, I'm not sure it always starts with racial tension or fear of a minority group. I think it can be uh, proactive in the sense that there's not a fear, but a deliberate targeting of a minority group where no where no fear is actually present, but a pretense of fear, uh, a, a stoking of fear is is going on. Uh, and I think to some extent that is uh, precisely what's happening uh, at the moment in, in the United States. I think there is a, uh, a stoking of fear of uh, immigrants, of uh, different minority groups. Uh, I think uh, there's also, uh, unfortunately, I, I think it's true that there is uh, a deliberate uh, attempt on the part of some small political fringe groups uh, to rehabilitate Nazism. Uh, in the Charlottesville rally, people were chanting blood and soil, which uh, is a Nazi slogan. And they were also chanting, Jews will not replace us. Uh, and this was the group of people that Donald Trump, when he was president, commented on that rally. And he said there were good people on both sides. And this was Donald Trump, who was reported by Mark Milley, his uh, military commander as having said that Hitler did a lot of good things and reported by another member of his uh, 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 cabinet uh, as uh, saying, why aren't my generals loyal to me like Hitler's generals were? Now, irrespective of Donald Trump's ignorance of the history of Hitler's, Hitler's generals, it seems to me that he is holding out Hitler's model behavior of his generals as, as a model for himself. I think we've got uh, a situation where Nazism is being rehabilitated in some circles. And I think this is very serious. Anyone else, last few words? No, okay. I wanna thank all the panelists and of course, General Dallaire who had to leave and also our provost, Provost Mariano uh, and the whole team that helped uh, make this happen. And the panelists in particular, thank you. I'm applauding you. It was an outstanding uh, fifth annual Genocide Studies Conference. Thank you for all your hard work and your presentations and answering questions. And I look forward to next year. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day and peace to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali.